our Heavenly Father, the fount of all goodness and grace, the cause of wisdom, the source of intelligence, we welcome you, O Lord, to this auspicious gathering of your beloved, who continuously give you thanks for every opportunity to learn something new and become fruitful to the works of your creation. We humbly come to you, not because we are worthy, but because we find ourselves in need of you, who is our strength and our hope, to continue despite the challenges we face in health, prosperity, and our solidarity with one another. We pray that today's gathering, made possible by the grace of advancements in technology and social media, become successful in its endeavors so we can offer it back to you as our humble offering to honor you, glorify you, and love you through our deeper connection with everyone. May we find bliss in today's session and become more productive children and co-creators of the earth. This we ask and pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Good afternoon to everybody watching our stream over on Facebook Live. I am Regina and I am your host for the Best Bar Ops Lecture Series titled Frequently Asked Topics on the 8 Bar Subjects. Welcome to our dear speaker, deans, professors, and bar takers tuning into our stream. Last week, we had a good run of various lectures that answer your FAQs on different bar subjects, which you may always watch again here on our Facebook page. We'd like to thank all of our previous speakers for sharing with us everything they know in order to help our dearest bar takers. The Frequently Asked Topics in the 8 Bar Subjects Lecture Series is brought to you by the Philippine Association of Law Schools in collaboration with Rex Bookstore and Edo Campion. To know more about this month's event partner, let's all watch this video. It is a noble aspiration to want to dedicate one's life in service of those who are oppressed and defenseless against the unfair and the unjust. It is an admirable advocacy in an adult, but it is awe-inspiring for a child to dream of speaking for those who are voiceless, to stand up in defense of the law and the common good. Because while every child dreams of a future, not every child is like you who dreams of shifting society and changing the world. But life brings many possibilities. You may have chosen to push through the roadmap to your goal, or you may have changed your priorities, opted to explore, preferred to discover the world, or work on yourself first before moving towards your dream. Regardless, what's destined for you will always call you back. A dream deferred is not always a dream denied. Rex Education helps in building that dream every step of the way. For seven decades, legal education has been at the heart of Rex Education, providing learners and practitioners with market-leading materials covering every discipline of law. Rex Education has become a standard in textbooks at every stage of a learner's journey and it shows through the 70 years of being the most preferred by students, authors, professors, and thought leaders. Estudyante pa lang ako, 1990. Yung mga professor, ang piniprescribe nila, yung mga law books, eh, ang publisher, Rex Publishing. So, at that time na nag, ay, nagsulat ako ng book, so, I, I decided to let Rex Publishing to publish my book. Bilang isang author ng law books, napaka-importante sa akin na yung mga librong sinulat ko accessible sa mga syudyante. 
Ang Rex Bookstore kasi, napakarami, napakaraming branches niyan eh. Hagang Mindanao, meron silang mga branches at napakarami nilang ahente na personal na pumupunta sa mga eskwelahan para may offer nung libro ko. Pati na rin yung mga libro ng mga ibang authors. So yun ang nakikita kong dahilan. Kaya uh, ako, pati na yung mga ibang authors ng law books, nagtitiwala sa Rex Publishing. Rex Materials helped me in reviewing for the bar exam. Most of the books that I used in law school were published by Rex. And I practically used the same old law books during the bar review, as they were complete and comprehensive. Being then a working student, it was financially hard to buy new books. Good thing Rex offered these law books at an affordable price. Also, the books published by Rex are known for their quality. The law books that I purchased from Rex and those that I borrowed from the school library, mostly published by Rex, became my strong armor, weapon, and constant companion as I hurdled the challenging life in law school. It is an honor to become part of Rex's family, and I am proud and happy to be with the best publisher in legal education. Being engaged in the education and training of future lawyers, the areas that are important to me when publishing books are excellence in the output and the commitment of the publisher in publishing materials for the improvement of the student's quality of education. It's for these reasons that I trust Rex as a publisher. With its more than 70 years of commitment to advance the quality of education of Filipino students, I am at ease in partnering with an institution who has the same level of desire for excellence as I do. From my years of partnering with Rex, I've experienced nothing but immense support, especially in working towards publishing books that are correct and precise. In this regard, I trust the learning materials that are published by Rex because of its rigorous process, not only in proofreading but also in ensuring quality. Rex Education implements an uncompromised editorial process to ensure quality content. In fact, Rex Education Law Books have received numerous book centenary awards by the Supreme Court. Because legal education is continuously evolving, Rex Education continuously innovates in legal education. There have been challenges, but Filipinos have always risen above, and we are thankful for the support. Rex Education's legacy in championing lifelong learning continues despite the changes in the landscape of legal education. And because we recognize those changes, Rex Education is able to provide the appropriate solutions Rex Education digital products and online platforms made our learning materials more accessible to the learners, which enabled them to have a better grasp of their dreams of becoming a lawyer. For you who's taking the leap, Rex Education has Prelex in preparation for law school admission exam. For you, who's uncertain, but keeps on striving because your dream is not yours only, but of your family and the society. No matter the challenges, you move forward. Because every minute means a hundred words read. Rex Education has reliable textbooks and codals that you can depend on in your study of law. For you, who's a step closer to your dream and is excited to bring pride to your family. Rex Education has bar reviewers to gear you up for your review subjects and help you pass the bar. For you, who's braving new beginnings, Rex Education has instructive books and learning solutions for new and seasoned lawyers. And for you who's in the forefront of shaping today's finest lawyers, 
No more second guessing. Publish your book and depend on Rex Education for editorial, project management, promotion, and distribution. Whether it be education, practice, or profession, let Rex Education help you be the best that you can be. Everything that we do is dedicated to helping you succeed because we value you. And your dream of becoming a lawyer and excelling as one. Not just for the past 70 years, but also for the following generations to come. Rex Education will be with you every step of the way. Studying the law? Mastering legal provisions? No need to record your voice. For you, help is on the way. Introducing Codify by Rex Education. With Codify, play, pause, and repeat the tracks of your choice. Anytime, anywhere. Download now and enjoy one week free trial. Thank you so much, Rex Bookster and Edu Campion for collaborating with us on this event. Today's program aims to determine the most frequently asked questions on the eight bar exam subjects and the ways to answer them namely for criminal law and special penal laws. These FAQs will be determined and answered by a distinguished guest this afternoon. He, he has prepared presentations to help the bar takers as they take the exam of their life. To introduce this afternoon's speaker, Dean Jemmy Lito Elfistin finished his bachelor's degree in psychology at the University of Santo Tomas, where he also earned units in master in psychology. Later, he earned his degree in bachelor of laws at San Sebastian College Recoletos, where he also finished his Master of Laws in 2014 and was conferred Bene Meritus, an honor equivalent to magna cum laude. Dean Jim has been a practicing lawyer since 1995, became a senior partner at Foja, Salinas, Stan, and Piston Law Offices from 2000 to 2007, and is currently senior partner at Padilla, Villanueva, Piston, and Garcia Law Offices. He was a former supervising lawyer at Sebastian Office of the Legal Aid, and rendered government services as Public Attorney 2 in Manila's District Office of the Public Attorney's Office Department of Justice for four years, and later as Legal Officer 4 in Manila City Council, City Hall of Manila for six years. Despite his busy schedule, Dean Jim still manages to contribute notable efforts to the academe. He is currently the Dean of Polytechnic University of the Philippines College of Law and the Bar Review Director of the PUP Bar Review Center. He is a professor of criminal law in PUP, University of Mahati, and Manila Adventist College School of Law, is a bar review lecturer and a mandatory co continuing legal education lecturer, and he is also the holder of Chief Justice Manganiban Professorial Chair on Liberty and Prosperity. Aside from his active efforts in teaching, he has also authored and co-authored several books used by bar takers and lawyers alike. He pioneered the law faculty association at San Sebastian College or Coletas College of Law in 2009, where he used to teach was the commissioner of the Committee on Bar Discipline of the Integrated Bar of the Philippines, and is also the former president of the Integrated Bar of the Philippines Manila One Chapter. He is a legal consultant of Kabalikat ng Bayan sa Kaonlaran Foundation, Inc., a non-stock, non-profit, socio-economic, civic organization that aims to uplift the underprivileged residents of Manila, and also sits as the president of the Philippine Association of Law Schools. Without further ado, let's all welcome this afternoon's lecture, Dean Jamilito Elfistin. Okay, um, thank you, Reggie. Um, thank you, uh, Rex and uh, the for partnering with the Philippine Association of Law Schools in this uh, project. And uh, a pleasant good afternoon to everyone. I hope you're all safe and uh, healthy and keep safe and healthy. No? Um, 
this is it. This is the last step in becoming a lawyer. So go and fight for your dream, the dream that God planted in your hearts. No? And uh, stay close to God because he's the one who um, gave that dream into your hearts and fight for it. Fight for the dream. He will give you all the resources that uh, you need. So bear with me in this uh, whole afternoon. We will have a journey in criminal law. We will discuss on uh, book one, book two, uh, special penal laws and the indeterminate sentence law and some bar questions uh, related to criminal law as well as uh, uh, other, other things, no? other things the that you need to uh, remember. Okay, so let's go to book one. Let's go first to, we will discuss based on the uh, syllabus, the revised syllabus no? given by the Supreme Court. So let's go to book one, Concepts and Principles in Criminal Law. Uh, what is criminal law? It is defined as the branch of public law, which, uh, it's, which it's a branch of public law which defines a crime Treats of its nature and provides for its punishment. It defines a crime, treats of its nature, and provides for its punishment. So why do we have to know the definition of a criminal law? Because if it is a criminal law, in case there is a doubt in the interpretation or construction of a penal law, then it is entitled to what? An interpretation in favor of the accused and strictly against the government. <clears throat> so the syllabus, nakita natin, uh, sabi ng, uh, uh, it will uh, discuss on mens rea and actus rea. So permit to me to Use the whiteboard. So, mens rea and actus rea. So, this is applicable to felony, no? to intentional felony or dolo. Mens rea means criminal mind. Actus rea means criminal act. Okay, for one to be liable criminally for intentional felony, no, uh, these two must concur. The person must have a criminal mind as well as a criminal act. So if he does not have, if he only uh, have a criminal mind but no criminal act, then this is not criminally liable. When is this possible? No, intentional. You know, diba? In, uh, um, internal acts. I'm sorry. Internal acts are not punishable. You can think of any crime, heinous crime, but for as long as it stays in your mind, there is no overt act. Then there is no criminal liability. No, it, because internal acts are not punishable. No, unless there's. Uh, a person will be liable if there's already a burn act. Now, could there be no criminal mind, but there is a criminal act? Yes. In exempting circumstances, no? where there is no criminal act, but there is a crime, uh, civil liability, like uh, absence of intelligence. For example, a boy who, a 10-year-old boy, who stabbed and killed his classmate is also a 10-year-old boy. No? Is there a criminal act? Yes, because his classmate died. Is there a criminal mind? No, because of the absence of intelligence. No, There is no criminal mind, but there's only criminal act. So for a person to be criminally liable, these two must concur, mens rea as well as actus rea. Okay. Let me proceed. Now, um, well, as I, well, there's a felony, crimes, acts, or omission punishable by the RPC is deemed as a felony. So uh, if, if the criminal act is not punished by the revised penal code, it is not a felony. 
gave the res- the sources of uh, criminal law. Sources are the following: the Revised Penal Code, the Acts of the Philippine Legislature, the National Assembly, the Congress of the Philippines, of course, yung uh, Batasang Pamansa, and other laws like uh, presidential decrees and executive orders. It's like uh, issued by uh, then President Marcos. Uh, the Spanish Penal Code of 1870, where we copied our revised penal code. Uh, question. Are there common crimes, you no know, common law crimes in the Philippines? So there is no common uh, uh, law crime in the Philippines because under Article uh, 21 of the revised penal code, it expressly provides that no felony shall be uh, punishable by any penalty not prescribed by law prior to its commission. Or the rule is nulem, nulum crimen nula puena sinilehe. Nulum crimen nula puena sinilehe. There is no crime if there is no law punishing the same. There is no crime if there is no law punishing it. So this nulum crimen nula puena sinilehe was the subject of the bar exams in the past. So many times it was asked, no? Crime is the product of the law. Okay. Other principle. What about uh, the doctrine of uh, pro reo? The doctrine of pro reo. Baka lang itanong sa bar. The doctrine of uh, uh, pro reo. No? Uh, when these circumstances are susceptible of two interpretations, susceptible of two interpretations, one favorable to the accused and one not favorable to the accused, then it should be in a way lenient or liberal to the offender. Okay? Liberal construction in consonance or consistent with the constitutional guarantee of presumption of innocence. Okay, so how is this applied? No, following the uh, pro doctrine uh, principle under art- Article Forty Eight, if you can recall, it's the complex crimes. No, crimes are complex and punished with a single penalty. The rational is that the accused who commits two crimes with single criminal impulse demo, demonstrates lesser perversity than when the crimes are committed by different acts and with several criminal resolutions. So that is how it was applied. Now, another basic principle, common bar problem. Okay, Enumerate the constitutional limitation on the power of Congress to enact penal laws. We know this already, ex post uh, facto law, due process, equal protection of laws, bill of attainder. So, uh, okay, let's discuss an ex post facto law. What is an ex post facto law? Okay, number one, it is one which makes an action done before the passage of the law and which was innocent when done criminal. No, It makes an action done criminal before the passage of the law and which was innocent when done, and punishes such action. Second, one which aggravates uh, a crime or makes it graver than when it was committed. No? So, uh, pinabigat yung act at that, uh, when, at that time that it was committed. Third, is one which changes uh, the punishment and inflicts greater punishment than the law applicable to the crime when it was committed. Fourth, one which alters the legal rules of evidence and receives less or different testimony than the law required at the time of the commission of the offense in order to convict the the defendant. So it uh, receives less or different testimony. Fifthly, one which assumes to regulate civil rights and remedies only, pero it in effect imposes a penalty or deprivation of a right, which when done was lawful. And lastly, one which deprives a, a person accused of a crime 
of some lawful protection to which he is entitled, such as the protection of a former conviction or acquittal or a proclamation of amnesty. But note, however, no, if the statute is penal in nature but favorable to the accused or convict and the accused or convict is not a habitual delinquent, you know that the penal statute will operate retroactively without becoming an ex post facto law. What about a bill of attainer? No? A Congress cannot enact a bill of attainer. So what is a bill of attainer? A bill of attainer is a legis legislative act which inflicts punishment without judicial trial. And what other constitutional limitations? Yung, well, we know this already, equal protection of laws, no uh, due process clause, no? Uh, the right to be heard under uh, Section 1 of Article 3 of the Constitution, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or security without due process of the law, nor shall any person be denied the equal protection of the laws. So let's go to um, uh, theories of criminal law. Theories of criminal law, we have the uh, classical and we have the, of course, there are still others, but this is uh, the common one, positivist. Yeah. This was asked several times in the bar uh, examinations and it probably will be asked also, no? But you know this already because the basis of criminal liability in classical is that a person has a free will, no? Free will to choose between evil and good. So therefore, the purpose of the uh, penalty is retribution. In classical, the purpose is retribution. In so far as positivist, no? A basis of liability, man is subdued by a strange and morbid phenomenon which compels him or conditions him to do wrong contrary to his own volition. No? Uh, which conditions him to do wrong contrary to his volition and uh, the purpose of, pen, of penalty is not retribution. The purpose in positive is, is the prevention or correction. Now, meron ding isa na tinatawag na uh, eclectic. Eclectic or the uh, mixed theory. Uh, we have the eclectic or the, the mixed one. <clears throat> uh, it is the combination of both. No? Uh, combination of uh, positivist and classical thinking. Crimes that are economic and social in nature no, uh, should be dealt with in a positive manner. We also have another one, uh, which may be uh, what we call as the utilitarian. Ito naman is that uh, the state should be protected from, uh, from actual or potential wrong wrongdoer. It's an extreme. It should be the state should be protected from an actual or from that of uh, potential wrongdoer. So <clears throat> to what theory do, do we subscribe? We subscribe to that of, uh, well, uh, classical, but uh, there are certain provisions 
that we apply the positivist theory, just like the accepting circumstances, as well as the justifying circumstances. Okay. Uh, let's go to other point. Characteristics of criminal law. Characteristics or features of criminal law. General or generality principle. Or we have the territorial or the territorial principle. And we have also the perspective or re retrospectivity. Okay. Do not interchange no, the concept of the generality principle from that of the territoriality principle. Most students memorize this, but sometimes no, they, 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 um, they uh, in, the, instead of the generality, they mistook it as the concept of territoriality rule. So, so not uh, to, to be confused, you start first with all persons. Because generality refers to persons. So all persons living or sojourning in the Philippines are subject to our criminal jurisdiction. Because when you talk about territorial, it refers to a place. No? So generality, persons. So we start by saying all persons living or sojourning in the Philippines are subject to our penal law. So a person cannot just claim, or um, so in my country, uh, possession of marijuana or shabu is perfectly allowed. So I'm seems I'm a citizen of the state, and I'm not a Filipino. I am not criminally liable. Is that argument tenable? No, because of the generality principle. So all persons, whether you are living here or you are just a tourist here, you are so, so joining in the Philippines, are subject to our penal law. Is this an absolute rule? No. There are two exceptions. Exceptions are the following. If it is covered under a treaty or laws of what we call as preferential, preferential application. Agreement between another country in the visiting forces agreement, a crime committed by an American U.S. military personnel now, as against a fellow U.S. military personnel. And the crime is committed within the Philippines. We do not have jurisdiction uh, to try the case because of the visiting forces agreement. No. It will be the U.S. who will have jurisdiction to try the case. But this is not applicable when the crime is committed by, uh, by a U.S. military personnel as against a, a Filipino citizen. We do have jurisdiction to try the case. Loss of preferential application. It gives preference to a particular class of person so such that if you belong to this uh, particular class of person, then you are not criminally liable. No? Halimbawa, si, uh, President Biden of the United States who visited the Philippines, no? who, for, for example, he drives his car uh, in, in uh, Ross Boulevard and he bumps on a pedestrian, would he be criminally liable? No, because of this. So who are not or exempted? The sovereigns or the heads of the state, ambassadors, ministers, 
plenipotentiary minister's residence and charge the affairs. Uh, they do not have criminal liability if they commit a crime within our territory, uh, within the Philippines. Okay, let's go to territorial principle. We can explain the general rule dito sa territorial principle in two ways. So all crimes committed, the first one, all crimes committed within, no, within the Philippine territory, then we have jurisdiction to try the case. Philippine court has jurisdiction to try the case. If the crime is all crimes committed outside the Philippine territory, then no jurisdiction. So that's, this in essence is the general rule. So you won't be confused. Ito na lang. No? Tatandaan nyo. So lahat ng krimen ginawa sa Pilipinas, we do have jurisdiction to try the case. If the crimes are committed outside the Philippines, sa labas ng Pilipinas, wala tayong pakialam. We do not have jurisdiction to try the case. The, the question is, is this an absolute rule? No, it's not an absolute rule. Under the second one, no. the rule is all crimes committed outside the Philippine territory, we do not have jurisdiction to try the case. However, this is not an absolute rule where there are cases where although the crime was committed outside the Philippine territory, yet, Philippine courts have jurisdiction to try the case. And what are those? Those which are uh, enumerated under Article 2 of the Revised Penal Code. Okay. Clear natin yan. Okay. Exceptions. There are a lot of bar questions under the first exception. Should or commit an offense while on a Philippine ship or airship? Okay, let's illustrate this. Assuming that this country is uh, Vietnam. And this is the Philippines. Of course, we do not recognize the nine dice rule. Uh, so this is our territory. So in between, if the vessel is here, do we have jurisdiction to decide the case? No? It depends. If it is a Philippine ship, or airship and when you know that it is a philippine ship or air, airship if it is registered in the philippines if this vessel is uh, not registered in the philippines we do not have jurisdiction to try the case okay now if the vessel is in the philippines do we have to, reg to, to determine whether it is registered in the Philippines or not? No, because in this case, we follow the general rule. Because the crime is committed, doon sa Philippine territory natin, we don't have to determine whether it is registered or not. Okay? Yes, sir, if the vessel is in Vietnam 
And the crime is committed inside the ve that vessel. Do we have to determine whether it's registered or not? No, we don't have to determine because the crime is within the territory of another country. No, that country has jurisdiction to try a crime committed within their territory. So this one is only applicable when the vessel is uh, what? It is in the high seas. And secondly, registered in the Philippines. These two must concur. Tandaan niya, baka lumabas sa bar yan. The vessel should be in the high seas and registered in the Philippines. If it is not, if it is registered in the Philippines, okay, but if it is within our Philippine territory or in Vietnam, we don't have to determine, no? Uh, because this is only ap applicable when the crime is committed outside the Philippines that you need to register and it is in the high seas. Pag nasa high seas yan, dapat uh, registered in the Philippines or outside the Philippine territory. If it's outside the Philippine territory, two things that you need to know. is First, it should be in the high seas. Second, it is registered in the Philippines. If it is within the territory of, an territory of another country, we don't have jurisdiction. If it is within the Philippines, we apply the general rule of the territoriality rule. Okay? Now, misleading question. So if you analyze the bar, the register, this vessel is owned by a Singaporean. Okay? Is that material? No, it's not material. It's not the ownership of the vessel, which is important, but no, where the register, where the vessel is registered. Another, the crew are all, all Indonesians. Do we have jurisdiction to try the case? Yes, if it is in the high seas and if it is registered in the vessel. So the, the citizenship of the crew is a material. The citizenship likewise of the owner of the vessel is immaterial. Okay, so remember that this may be asked in the bar. Second, should forge... Or counterfeit. What should be forged or what should be counterfeited? Any coin or currency notes or obligations and securities issued by the Philippine government. So let's go back to our illustration. Assuming A is a Vietnamese who forged and counterfeited. No? Yung 100 uh, peso bill natin. O kaya yung coins natin. If it comes to the Philippines, can A be prosecuted? Yes. Because of article of, of paragraph 2 of the territoriality rule. That even uh, if the crime is committed outside the country, but if the act consists of forging or counterfeiting coin or currency notes or obligations and, and securities issued by the Philippine government, we do have jurisdiction to try the case. Treasury bill is an obligation. Philippine charity sweepstakes, Philippine sweepstakes is also an obligation issued by the uh, Philippines. Third, should be liable for the uh, introduction of the obligations and securities uh, mentioned in the preceding article. So this is only limited to obligations and securities. It did not mention, the law did not mention uh, coin or currency notes. So this refers to the act of a smuggler introducing the way. Smuggler. Uh, let's go back to the facts. Bawa si B. B is a Vietnamese, no? And he had a, a partner, Filipino counterpart, no? They met on the high seas. No, he smuggled the forged uh, obligations and securities uh, issued or by, uh, no, uh, forged by A. Nag-forged si A ng obligations and securities and he gave it to B. G, G, B 
is about to give it to sea. And they met on the high seas, not in Philippine waters. Do we have jurisdiction to try the case? Yes. Yes. Next. Number four. Should a commit a crime against national security and the law of nations? Memorize the crimes against national security or the law of nations. Why? Ah. Nambawa, rebellion is committed outside the Philippine territory. Nambawa, si, si F is ano siya, supporting rebellion in the Philippines. Purchasing arms no? uh, to support. And he's the leader of rebellion in the Philippines. Can he be uh, uh, prosecuted in the Philippines? No, he is not. He cannot because... The crime is again not against national security because rebellion is a crime against public order and not against national security. So what are the crimes against national security? Um, treason is one, espionage is one, uh, law of nations, piracy, mutiny uh, are also uh, included. Okay, that's number five. Number four is if he's a public officer and he commits a crime no, in relation to his function on, or his duties. So ergo, not all crimes committed by a public officer abroad no, would, uh, uh, would be prosecuted, can be prosecuted in the Philippines. No, the crime committed by a public officer must have a relation to his office or function or duty. Kung pinabili lang siya ng uh, kanyang boss and then he uh, misappropriated the, 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 the money of personal money of his boss, then is that he cannot be prosecuted in the Philippines. It will be different if he's a disbursing officer no, in, in abroad sa Philippine Embassy. No, and he committed the he, and he committed the crime of malversation or even bribery. Then he would be liable. He would fall under this one, although the act was committed outside the Philippine territory. Now remember that. So we have prospectivity. This is the third characteristic. The uh, prospectivity principle. <clears throat> uh, ang uh, prospectivity principle, do not forget that penal laws do not have a retroactive application. The law looks forward and not backward. Lex prospicit non respicit. Lex prospicit non respicit. The law looks forward and not backward. Exception to the general rule, of course, if the penal law is favorable to the accused, no, uh, who is not a habitual delinquent. No, if it's favorable to the accused, then uh, it can be given retroactive effect, except no. When the accused is a habitual delinquent, or if the law expressly provides that it should not be given a retroactive application. Let's go to the repeal of penal laws, no? repeal of the penal laws. It also affects the uh, principle of prospectivity. Let's go to a repeal. So there's a first law. Two, two instances. So there is a prior of uh, the first law or prior law and a second law. The second law expressly no, repealed. The first law. 
what is the consequence? You also have a situation when there is a first law, which was repealed impliedly. Impliedly repealed the first law. What is the implication? Okay. <clears throat> If a penal law is expressly repealed by another law, yung ano, ito sinabi natin, the first illustration, expressly repealed by another law, the crime is obliterated. What are the consequences? So number one, yung mga pending criminal actions will be dismissed. Pending actions will be dismissed and one already convicted under the repealed law and serving sentence by virtue of a final judgment shall be released. No, they shall be released unless he's a habitual delinquent or if the law provides otherwise. The reason, because there is no more law punishing the same. What about uh, when it is impliedly repealed? No? If a penal law is impliedly repealed, we call it repeal by reenactment. And the act punished in the first law is still punished in the second law. No? The following are its consequences. Number one, yung mga pending case is not dismissed. Second, the penalty in the second law will only apply if favorable to the accused who is not deemed to be habitual delinquent. <clears throat> now, iba yon. If we are, if we're talking about uh, when the crime is um, expires, we're talking about in this case the crime is repealed. In no, but if the penal law expires on a fixed date. Nakalagay doon sa batas, it has an expiration. No more conviction can be have sub subsequently. But an offender already convicted and serving sentence by final judgment under the penal law before its expiry will not be released. The benefits are not retroactive. Okay. Alimbawa naman, sir, when the law which expressly repeals a prior law is itself repealed. No, what will happen? What will be the consequence? Baba ito, merong third law. No. Ni repeal. Yung second law, which uh, expressly repealed the prior law. So second illustration, meron ding third law, which also repealed the second law. If there is a law, with that repealed a law that uh, express that expressly referred the first law ang tanong ko eto ba mare revive the first, will the first law be revived in the second illustration will the first law or the prior law be revived in this case no when the law, so first illustration, when the law which expressly repeal a prior law is itself repealed, ito yung third law. The first law, will it be revived? The law first repealed will not be revived. No, unless the repealing law so expressly provides. No, but the general rule is that the first law uh, will not be revive the first law repealed will not be revived second illustration when the law which impliedly repeals a prior law is itself repealed the prior law is revived so that's the difference between the two yung isa revived unless the repealing law or the third law provides otherwise This is revived. This is not revived unless the law provides otherwise. Okay.
Uh, let's go to another point. <clears throat> okay, we say that uh, penal laws, uh, how, how will it be construed? Penal laws in favor of the liberal penal laws must be construed and interpreted liberally in favor of the accused. But remember, itong interpretation is only applicable if the law is ambiguous and leaves room for interpretation and accused is not a habitual delinquent. Now, meron din tinatawag ng uh, uh, equipoise rule. What is this equipoise rule? Where the evidence for the prosecution and the defense are equally balanced, the scale should be tilted in favor of the accused in obedience to the constitutional uh, presumption of innocence. Almost pareho sila ng, ano, the same as that of pro reo. But, you know, remember, equipoise rule, you start first with the evidence. No? When the evidence for the prosecution and the defense are equally balanced. Now, it should be tilted, the scale of justice should be tilted in favor of the accused. Again, in consonance with the constitutional uh, provision of presumption of innocence. Okay, let's continue. Cases, alam mawa naman, uh, foreign vessel in the Philippines. Cases where the offense is committed on board a foreign vessel while in the Philippine waters. No? Number one, do we have jurisdiction to try the case? Number one, situation. Kung warship yan, walang problema. If the vessel, if the foreign vessel is a warship, then our country have no jurisdiction because the ship is deemed as an extension of the foreign country to which it belongs. And it's not subject to the laws of another state. And this is where we have the English rule and the French rule. Now, if the foreign vessel is a merchant vessel, no, there are two rules as to jurisdiction. Do not apply English rule and French rule if it is a warship, a warship in extension of its country or the country that it uh, or the flag that it carries. foreign merchant vessel so we have the english rule and the french rule now, how do we differentiate these two <clears throat> crimes on board a vessel while on waters of another country are triable in that country so that's the English rule. So crimes committed on board a foreign vessel while on waters of another country are triable in that country or in that host country unless it, all, unless it only involve, involves uh, purely internal management of the vessel. Uh, if it is a French, so French rule, naman, such crimes are not triable in that country no? unless those affect the peace and security of that country or the safety of the state is endangered. Pero they will arrive at the same conclusion. No? Limbawa. This is the Philippines. Okay. And again, siguro Vietnam ulit.
the vessel is from Vietnam and the port of the destination is the Philippines. Bawa sa Manila. Okay. That's the first illustration. The second one is it will only pass through the Philippines. Bawa. Yun. Going to perhaps Australia. So, dumaan siya sa Pilipinas, no? So, here it's uh, in transit. The first one is in transit. Uh, the first one is we are the port of destination. The second one is it's in transit. So, what is the implication in this case? Uh, if the Philippines is the port of destination of the foreign vessel, no, and it is not in transit, just like in the first illustration, no, any crime on board the vessel, kahit possession ng opium, no, as held in the case of Asing, no, it is triable in our courts, irrespective of whether the crime involves public order or not, no, unless the crime committed involves uh, internal management of the ship. This is the, ap the application of the English rule. So if the Philippines is the port of destination, lahat ng uh, kahit na possession lang yan no, of opium, we have jurisdiction to try the case. No? Unless the crime involves uh, purely internal management. Now in the second illustration, while the real port of destination is Australia, and it was only in transit in the Philippines, in transit through the Philippine waters. The crime is triable only if it affects the breach of public order. No? If not, it is not triable in our country. Hence, lumbawa, yung possession, yung possession ng opium, with Philippine courts have no jurisdiction if it is only uh, in transit in Philippine waters and the port of destination is Australia. No, so if it is mere possession, unlike the first illustration where we have jurisdiction, the second illustration, mere possession of opium is not uh, punishable in the Philippines unless the opium is landed. So, meron ng breach, breach of public order, okay? Or unless when the when, when the case involves smoking, the, an opium in our territory, because why? It already constitutes a breach of public order as it causes such drug to produce its pernicious effects in our country. Okay, But uh, whatever it is, um, we will arrive at the same uh, conclusion. A continuing crime Mbawa, committed on board a foreign vessel sailing from a foreign court and which enters the Philippine territory nagsimula sa Vietnam malimbawa tapos uh, it enters the Philippine the territory it is triable before Philippine courts no if the act is not punishable in the foreign country the well the vessel originates but it is punishable under our laws our courts have jurisdiction to try the case okay yon Crimes committed on board a foreign, let me just uh, remind you, na, crimes committed on board a foreign merchant vessel while on the high seas are not triable in the Philippines. Philippines have no jurisdiction to take cognizance of crimes no, committed on high seas on board of a transport or other vessel not registered or licensed in the Philippines. Um, this is not included, but per, uh, kasi dapat basic to eh, felony. When we talk about felony, uh, acts or omissions punishable under the revised penal code are deemed as felony. 
So we have dolo or culpa. You have freedom. You have intelligence. And you have third, criminal intent. Intent or you have uh, malice. Evil motive, evil intent. In culpa, you have freedom, intelligence, you have imprudence, negligence, lack of foresight, and lack of skill. So, um, is good faith a proper defense in Dolo? Yes, no? good faith negates criminal intent. If, you, if a person acts in good faith, no? it destroys criminal intent. So, there is no criminal liability. Question, is good faith a defense in culpa? No. no? A person may be uh, in acting in good faith, but he can be also at the same time acting with negligence. So what is the proper defense in so far as culpa is concerned? No? If one is charged with imprudence, negligence, lack of foresight, and lack of skill, good faith is a defense, but exercise of what? Do diligence. Or he exercised the same with caution. No? I'm not over speeding. I'm within the speed limit allowed by, by law. And the pedestrian all of a sudden no, uh, just uh, cross the street. Now, these are the elements of also uh, voluntariness. Okay. Just a reminder on that. <clears throat> Actus non facit reum, nisi mens uh, sit rea, a crime is not committed if the mind of a person performing the act complaint of is innocent. So when the accused uh, acted in obedience to the superior orders, especially they are military subordinates. No? They could not question the order of the superiors. And when they obeyed in good faith without being aware of their illegality, meaning to say yung order is not patently unlawful. They're not aware of their illegality uh, and without any fault or negligence on their part, the act is not uh, accompanied by any criminal intent. So can a crime be committed without criminal intent? Yes, number one, if it's culpa. Well, you know, kanina, in my illustration, intent is not an element, but in prevents negligence, lack of foresight, and lack of skill. So a crime may, may be committed even without criminal intent if it's culpa. And number two, if the crime is punishable under a special penal law. Okay, so let's go to the difference between crimes punished under. Uh, SPL and that of uh, the Revised Penal Code. Or it can also be the difference between mala inse and mala prohibita. Mala inse and mala prohibita. Mala inse. Okay. These are crimes punished. Mala inse. Uh, mostly applicable to special uh, no, revised crimes punished under the revised penal code. Mala prohibita. Applicable to crimes punished under special penal laws. Or if you're asked either uh, the difference between mala inse and mala prohibita, you can say first by saying, oh, uh, this is applicable to crimes punished under RPC if it's mala inse. 
or mala prohibita usually applies to crime Spanish under SPL. But if the question is differentiate RPC from that of SPL, you can state it. Well, RPC is mala inse and uh, uh, SPL is mala prohibita as a general rule. No? Not this is not an absolute rule that lahat ng crimes under RPC is mala mala inse. When you talk about mala inse, you say that it is evil in its in nature, no? Ah, uh, katulad ng rape, that's evil in nature. Uh, taking the life of another person, like murder, it's mala inse. It's evil in its nature. Uh, illegal possession of firearms, it's not mala inse because you can use a firearm to defend yourself. It's mala prohibita. No, before you can carry a firearm, you need to have a license. No, and uh, what is Spanish is voluntarily breaching. No, that's the provision of the law that you have to secure a license. Now, uh, mala in RPC is not always mala in se, like technical malversation or illegal use of public funds. Although it is punished under the revised penal code, no, uh, technical malversation is mala prohibita. So therefore, good faith is not a proper defense. No? Uh, like for example, kasi pag mala in se yan, uh, uh, good faith is a defense. Uh, bago in, ano naman, there is Intent, criminal intent. SPL, no intent. So it's mala in says it's uh, then good faith is a defense to the gate criminal intent. In mala prohibita, good faith is not a proper defense. Okay, so let's go back Anina, in my illustration. So in technical malversation, although it's punished, and this is an exception, although it's an RPC, it's bala prohibita. Therefore, good faith is not a proper defense. Can you recall uh, yung, ano, um, technical malversation or illegal use of public funds? When there is a, uh, a law that allocates a particular a, a public fund, no? there's already a law or ordinance that allocates a particular fund for a particular purpose. And secondly, it was used for another purpose. It was used for another public purpose. And number three, no, uh, it was used in a public purpose other than for which the law or ordinance intended it to be used. So, alimbawa, the... Uh, the the, there is a law that uh, allocates a particular fund for the construction of the building. Now, since the garon ng uh, typhoon, it was used to rehabilitate. So, therefore, good faith siya. There was no actual misappropriation on his part. But would that be a proper defense, though? Because good faith is not uh, a proper defense because it is deemed as mala prohibita. What about uh, will there be SPL that? are not deemed mala prohibita, but mala in se. Evil in its nature. Yes. No? Like a plunder. Plunder, it's though, although it's uh, under the anti-plunder law, it's a special penal law, but Supreme Court said that it is mala in se. It is evil in its nature. Ergo, good faith is a proper defense. Next. No, the uh, stages of execution. The stages of execution, consummated, frustrated, attempted, applicable here, no, in mala in se, so that the proper penalty can be imposed. But this is not considered in mala prohibita because it's deemed, the act is always deemed as consummated. So, walang, walang attempted uh, stage uh, mala prohibita. Unless the SPL uh, uses the stages of, of execution. But the general rule, no, it's always on a consummated. So kung walang injury, attempted lang, no criminal liability. That was asked in the bar exam in the past. So remember that. 
Next, consummated, uh, frustrated, attempted, persons criminally liable. Who are the persons criminally liable? The principals, accomplices, accessories. They are determined in order to impose the proper penalty. Mala prohibita, no, the offender is deemed to be a principal. Generally. Unless, of course, ang sabi ng SPL, it adopted also persons criminally such as person, uh, principals, accomplices, and accessories. But in the absence of which, the offender is deemed to be a principal. No? Next. The mitigating, the ordinary mitigating and generic aggravating are considered in order to impose the proper penalty. In mala prohibita, it's not considered. No? So even if a person voluntarily, remember this, this may be asked in the bar exam. Even if the person uh, uh, voluntarily surrendered, even if he entered a plea of guilt, but it is mala prohibita, then sorry na lang. No? It's not considered, it will not be uh, appreciated to lower the penalty because it's not applicable. What else? The nomenclature of penalties of the RPC, like uh, RPC, like reclusion perpetua, reclusion temporal, uh, no, we determine that for the proper penalty to be imposed in in mala prohibita, no, because there is uh, the law provides for specific penalty. In, K, in, 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 in its violation. However, no, there are SPL that uses the nomenclature of penalties of the revised penal code. Like yung child abuse. No, child abuse, meron siyang mga reclusion, meron siyang prison. So, um, it, it has an effect. Why? Because in the imposition of islaw or indeterminate sentence law, no, the, the formula that will be used to obtain the maximum term and the minimum term of the indeterminate sentence is that of the RPC and not that of the special penal law. No? But generally, no, yung, uh, kung hindi ginagamit, kung hindi that fall by exception, it, it's... Uh, uh, it is not applicable because the law specifically uh, provides for penalty, just like reclusion perpetua. Differentiate reclusion perpetua from life imprisonment. Reclusion perpetua <clears throat> is a punishment under the RPC imposed under the revised penal code. Life imprisonment is under special penal law. No? And the duration of penalty under Reclusion perpetua is 20 years, one day to 40 years. Sa life imprisonment, malang ganon. Talagang life imprisonment siya. Okay? Let's clear all these drawings. So, remember, as a rule, uh, attempted violation of a special law is not punished. Actual injury is required. Uh, baka lang lumabas sa bar. Medyo feeling ko lang. Alam ba, uh, sa Antigraph and Corrupt Practices Act, wala namang injury sa gobyerno because it's only attempted. No? It's the only attempted violation of a special penal law. It is not punished. Actual injury is required. Hmm. Intent and motive. Lumabas sa bar. Differentiate intent from that of motive. Second question, when is motive relevant to prove a case? When is it necessary to be established? Several times this was asked the bar. M, no, pag sabing motive, you start with M, letter M. Motive, moving power. It is the moving power which impels a person to do an act for a definite result. Moving power which impels a person to do an act for a definite result. What about intent? Intent is the purpose for we, the purpose for using a particular means to bring about a desired result. 
Is the motive an element of the crime? No, and motive is not an element of the crime, but intent is an element uh, of intentional crimes. Motive, if attending, if it's uh, attending a crime, always precedes the intent. So, ang tanong, when is motive relevant to a to prove a case? Motive is relevant to prove a case in the following. Number one, kung may duda as to the identity of the offender, when there is doubt as to the identity of the offender. Second, when the act committed uh, gives rise to variant crimes. Third, there is the need to determine the proper crime uh, to be imputed against the offender. Note, it is not necessary to prove motive when the offender is positive, positively identified naman siya. Hindi na kinakailangan. Or the crime, uh, or the crime uh, did not give rise to uh, variant crimes. Okay. Yon. So we, we, we already finished with the uh, general principles. We will now go to the circumstances. Justifying, exempting, mitigating, aggravating and alternative circumstances. Let's go to justifying circumstances. Differentiate, differentiate justifying from exempting. This is a favorite bar question. Sorry. Differentiate uh, justifying under Article 11 and exempting is under Article 12 of the Revised Penal Code. Similarities. And so far, similarities is concerned. There is no criminal liability to both of them. There is no criminal liability, but the uh, justification is different. No criminal liability in justifying war. Why? Because the act is deemed to be in accordance with law. The act is lawful. So there is no criminal liability. In exempting, there is no uh, criminal liability because of the absence of the element of uh, voluntariness. Ito, justifying lawful kasi siya. The act is lawful. In exempting, it's because the, of the absence of voluntariness. Tanggalin mo yung freedom. No, walang criminal liability. Like irresistible force. Irresistible force is an exempting circumstance. No? So wala siyang freedom. Uh, minority. If the age is uh, uh, below, uh, is 15 or below, absence of what? Intelligence. That's why there is no criminal liability. Next, what about their difference? There is civil, what about with respect to civil liability? With respect to civil liability, in, in so far as justifying is concerned, there is also no civil liability. In exempting, there is civil liability. So that's the difference. In effect, in justifying circumstances, there is no criminal liability as well as no civil liability. No, is that an absolute rule that there is no civil liability? No, there's an exception, which is paragraph four of Article Eleven. What about no criminal liability? Meron bang exemption? No, this is an absolute rule. In justifying and exempting, always no criminal liability. In civil liability, only a general rule. 
No, there is no civil liability except paragraph 4 of Article 11, which is what? State of necessity or avoidance of if greater evil. That's the only instance na meron silang civil liability. In exempting, the general rule, on the other hand, is there is civil liability. Exception, yes, if in justifying paragraph 4 of Article 11, in exempting, meron the exception, which is also paragraph 4, but of Article 12, which is accident. And paragraph 7. So in this instances, paragraph 4 and 7 of article 12, there is no civil liability. So that's accident, accident when, when he commits a lawful or uh, an act lawful or for some insuperable cause. Okay. Let's go to specifically. Uh, justifying. I hope you're still here with me. So we have uh, self defense. We have uh, defense of a relative and defense of a stranger. Okay, common element, there is unlawful aggression. Second, there is reasonable necessity of the means employed to prevent or repel the same. And there is lack of sufficient provocation magkasama yan ha? sufficient lack of sufficient provocation it's not lack of provocation it's sufficient provocation when you talk about defense of relatives the same the same uh, element the, the first two except that uh, the third they differ in case the provocation was given by the person attack then uh, the person defending had no part therein. No part. So far as defense of stranger, uh, the same. Two, unlawful aggression, reasonable necessity of the means, means employed to prevent or repel the same, except that he is not induced no, hindi siya induced by revenge, resentment, or by some evil motive. If he if he is motivated by revenge or by uh, resentment or by some evil motive, then he cannot raise uh, defense of stranger. Let's go to to uh, just an idea. Later on, I will be discussing uh, in details. A no full aggression uh, when there is peril to one's life, limb, or property. No, uh, when there is an actual uh, threat upon a person. So, a no full aggression can be actual or imminent. When you talk about imminent, it should not be based on suspicion, but it should be at the point of happening. No, at the point of happening. So, lahat. Remember this, no? Sa justifying, sa defense of a relative, sa defense of a stranger, there must be peril on the life of the person that you are defending, that he is defending. If you're defending yourself, dapat may threat sa buhay mo. 
No, kung wala namang peril to one's life, there is no justified self-defense. Defense of a relative, dapat meron ding threat sa buhay, nanganganib yung buhay ng relative mo. No? And there is no peril to the life of your relative, then this is not applicable. And so also goes with this defense of stranger. His life must be in danger. If not, then if he's the aggressor, then he will be a co-principal. He will be a co-principal. No? Remember that. <clears throat> Reasonable necessity of the means of ploy to prevent or repel. The second one, uh, <clears throat> ang sabi dito ay, uh, it's, it's not based on a mathematical, mathematical computation that if one uses, uh, a, uh, if one uses a knife, that you should also defend yourself by using a knife. No, it's not. So there are two things that you have to consider. One is if it's uh, if that is the if if the person is acting under uh, the impulse of self-preservation, no, or and that if it is the only available means to defend himself, no, pedion, no, could be considered as reasonable. Lack of sufficient provocation. Um. Let me illustrate this. A person can claim self-defense on the following. If there is a provocation, you can still claim self-defense provided it is not sufficient. No, not sufficient. Pag ano bang sinasabi ng ano, sufficient provocation? Ano, what is the meaning of sufficient provocation? So, it is adequate to steer one to its commission. So, uh, and secondly, you can also claim uh, self-defense if there is sufficient provocation, but it comes from a third person. So it's not between the victim and the accused, but it comes from a stranger or from a third person. Thirdly, a person can still claim uh, self-defense if there is sufficient provocation, but it is not immediately preceding the act if there is the presence of sufficient provocation but it is not immediately preceding the act then it's still deemed as you can still claim self-defense so a person cannot claim self-defense or there is no self-defense if therefore there is sufficient provocation but it is immediately preceding the act. If it is immediately preceding the act. So what's the difference? Si A sinampal si B. No? Pero sinampal niya yun, uh, and it happened already uh, one year ago. Nakita ni B si C. So gusto ni B bubawi. So he pulled the knife to kill a, but A successfully was able to parry it. He defended himself. No? And he killed B in defending himself. Now, A claims self-defense. Sabi ng prosecution, hindi ka pwedeng, hindi mo pwedeng i-claim ang self-defense kasi sinampal mo siya. Kung hindi ka mo sinampal si B at ipinahiya no? before the people, then he will not uh, intend, uh, in, uh, uh, he will not uh, kill you. He will not in, uh, plan to kill you or to retaliate. But in this case, it happened one year ago. So he's now uh, able to recover his emotions. Unlike, say for example, if it happened on the same occasion and at the same time. So isang uh, a gathering, A without reason slapped B. And B felt embarrassed. And because of doubt, that, he pulled a knife. And he is about to stab A, and A, for lucky for him, was able to defend himself, to parry it, and kill uh, B. Now the question is, can A claim self-defense? He cannot. Why? Because indeed, it's immediately preceding the act. It happened right after he slapped that B pulled the knife, and if uh, A would not have slapped him, then slap him 
then we would not have pulled this knife as well. So this is the difference between the two. In so far as a uh, uh, defense of a relative, the first and the second are present. The third element, in case the provocation was given by the person attacked, the person defending had no part therein. Dapat when he entered the scene of the crime, the life of his relative should be in danger. If there is no danger on the relative's life, then uh, this is not applicable. There is no defense of a relative. If, say for example, he saw his brother stabbing another person who is already defense, defenseless and he helped his brother, he would now be deemed as a cop principal. Defense of a stranger, he should not be induced by revenge, resentment, or evil motive. If uh, the purpose is actually to commit the act of revenge, then who would be liable? Okay. Let's go to, uh, let's go specifically na lang. Uh, who are the strangers? Uh, who are the strangers? Who are the relatives, I mean? Defense of re relatives. Spouse, ascendants, descendants, second. Legitimate, natural, adopted brothers or sisters. Third is... Uh, relatives by affinity, relatives by affinity within the same degree. Anong same degree? Ito yun. Okay, could be a, a parent-in-law, a son-in-law, a brother-in-law, a sister-in-law. And a fourth will be relatives by consanguinity within the fourth civil degree. So refers to the first cousin. If you're defending your second cousin, it will not fall under uh, defense of relative. But don't automatically say... Defending a second cousin is a defense of a stranger. No, not, 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 not automatically. You can say it may. It may fall under defense of a stranger provided that he is not induced by revenge, resentment, or some evil motive. Now, for up to first, so if you defended the child of your first cousin, still it will not fall under defense of a relative. So these are only the relatives. Of course, yung affinity, it must be existing. Dapat hindi na, kung namatay na yung, yung, alamabawa, yung wife niya at wala naman silang uh, anak and then he's remarried, then wala na silang, ano, tapos na yung ano nila, relatives by affinity. So um, again, let's let's just uh, discuss all the specifically defense of uh, self-defense. Right included in self-defense, it uh, includes not only defense of the person or body of the one assaulted, but also that of his rights. No? The, those rights, the enjoyment of which is protected by law. So aside from the right to life on which rest the legitimate defense of our person, we have the right to property acquired by us and the right to honor, which is not the least price of man's patrimony. So to prove self-defense, the accused must show with clear and convincing evidence that hindi ikaw an an unlawful aggressor, that he was not the unlawful aggressor, that there was, second, that there was lack of sufficient provocation on his part, and third, he employed reasonable means to prevent or repel the aggression. The scope includes self-defense uh, not only of life, no? 
pero applicable din ito to rights like the right uh, like those of chastity o kaya property and honor and it has been applied also to the crime of libel so there is self defense of chastity so to be entitled to a complete uh, self defense of chastity there must be attempt to rape and it is not necessary that the actual act be uh, committed as the ear eminence thereof will ju just justify the woman to kill the offender if he has no other means to defend himself pero kung tapos na that's another story right defense of property pagka defense of property it is necessary that there must be an attack on the property coupled also with the attack of the person of the one entrusted with said property. Self-defense in libel. When a person is libel, he may hit back with another libel, which, if adequate, will be justified. In physical assault, no? retaliation is unlawful after the attack has ceased but not in the case where it is aimed at a good person's uh, good name. So once the aspersion is cast, it's a sting clings, no? it remains. And the one thus defamed may avail himself of all the necessary means to shake it off. The, clear, the law is clear <clears throat> that unlawful aggression must come from the victim. No? So, uh, aggression must be unlawful. Uh, halimbawa, pa din paramour. Paramour surprise in the act of adultery cannot invoke self-defense if he killed the offended husband who was assaulting him. Sinabi ng Supreme Court yun. At ang sabi ng Supreme Court, kahit na daw true, and even if the deceased did succeed in entering the room in which the accused at yung deceased wife were lying no nakaiga pareho sila and did immediately pagkatapos nakita no uh, uh, assaulted the accused giving him several uh, blows with uh, the bolo uh, that assault was deemed sabi sa pre court natural lang yan and lawful for the reason that it was made by a deceived husband no and in order to defend himself he had to kill his wife and the accused and kung, if they were caught in the act of sexual intercourse, he would have exercised a lawful right. No? It would fall under, kung naalala nyo, Article 247 of the RPC. <clears throat> uh, no lawful aggression because there was no imminent and real life danger to life or limb of the accused. As I've always emphasized uh, uh, a while ago, uh, if there is no imminent or peril or, even, or, or real danger to the life and limb of the accused, there is no uh, unlawful aggression. So retaliation is retaliation, the self-defense, you know this already. No retaliation is not a self-defense because the aggression that has begun by the injured party already ceased to exist when the accused attack him. In self-defense, the aggression dapat must still still be existing when the aggressor was injured or disabled by the person making a defense. Okay, remember also that the unlawful aggression must come from the person who was attacked by the accused. And the nature and the character, location, extent of wound of the accused allegedly inflicted by the injured party may claim, may belay the claim of self-defense. Paano nangyari ito? In number of wounds received by the deceased. Lumbawa, 20 in number. So yung plea ng self-defense, you cannot seriously entertain that. O kaya, when the aggressor flees already, no? Unlawful aggression no longer exists. If he runs away already, wala na yun. No? The one making a defense has no more right to kill or even to wound that person or that former aggressor. But it's different when there is retreat. So titignan nyo. Retreat to make 
to take more advan advantageous position. That's not running away. That's not fleeing. So if it is clear that the purpose of the aggressor in retreating is to take a more advantageous position to ensure the success of the attack already begun by him, the unlawful aggression is still considered continuing. And the one making the defense has the right to pursue him in his retreat and to disable him. If there's agreement to fight, no, no unlawful aggression. Kaya lang tingnan nyo, dapat the challenge to a fight must be accepted. Now let's look into certain uh, bar uh, examination suggested answers. We don't have to the time already to look into the questions. But from the uh, suggested answers, you can already see you know, how the law was applied. You know? Like in one case, you know, suggested answer. No, the accused claim of self-defense of honor should not be sustained because the aggression on her honor had ceased when she stabbed the aggressor. Under the law, unlawful aggression must be continuing when the aggressor was injured or disabled by the person making a defense. No? So, ito, baka tanungin kayo, medyo similar to this one, at least uh, you know this. So, if uh, in so far as defending one's honor, it should that a lawful aggression should not uh, cease already. Otherwise, she cannot trace that. No? As I've said, with, with respect to uh, uh, reasonableness of the necessity of the necessity depends upon the circumstances. Number one, necessity of the course of action taken. Second, necessity of the means used. The test of reasonableness of the means used will depend on uh, the nature and quality of the weapon used by the aggressor, yung kanyang physical condition character, size, and other circumstances, and those of the person defending uh, himself, and also the place and occasion of the assault. No? Pero pagka daw uh, ang involved is a peace officer, iba na yung rule. So what is the rule regarding the reasonableness of the necessity of the means employed when the one defending himself is a peace officer. Unlike private individual, your peace officer has the duty no? and it requires him to overcome his opponent. <clears throat> Third requisite, uh, lack of sufficient uh, provocation. A sufficient means as proportionate to the damage caused by the act and adequate to steer one to its commission. Um, who are deemed as strangers? No, any person not included uh, on uh, paragraph two of, the, uh, of this article no? is considered a stranger. Now, remember again, the third requisite will be lacking if such person was prompted by his grudge against the assailant because the alleged defense of the stranger would only be a pretext. Kunyari, ginamit niya lang. One bar problem, ang suggested answer is this. No? A may invoke the justifying circumstance of defense of a stranger since he was not involved in the fight and he shot C while the latter was about to stab B. And there being no indication that A was induced by revenge, resentment, or other evil motive in shooting C, his act is justified under Article 3, uh, Article 11, Paragraph 3 of the RPC. The fourth is, uh, diba, the Self-defense, defense of a relative, defense of a stranger. Number fourth of justifying is avoidance of greater evil. Damage to another. 
the term includes also or covers injury to persons and damage to property. That the evil, sabi na batas, that evil sought to be avoided actually exists. So requirement is that the evil must actually exist. If the evil sought to be avoided is really expected or anticipated or may happen in the future, that is not applicable. And also, tandaan nyo, yung greater evil should not be brought about by his negligence or imprudence of the actor. Also, when the accused was not avoiding any evil, so hindi he cannot invoke this justifying circumstance of avoidance. No? So the evil which brought about the greater evil must not result from a violation of law by the actor. No? Hindi dapat result from a violation of the law by the actor. So state of necessity exists kung merong clash between two unequal rights. The lesser right giving way to a greater right. The state of necessity must not be due to negligence or violation of any law. No. So this is the only instance yung sinabi ko kanina that there is civil liability. No? But this is born not by the actor but by the person or uh, persons benefited by his act. So yung isang uh, uh, illustration dito when uh, the fiance no the girl no did not appear during the marriage the celebration of marriage because she realized that uh, no, she actually does not love this guy eh ano na uh, uh, preparations were already made marami nang ginasto si guy no uh, the wedding, uh, the, the payment for the church, and also sa lahat. No? Um, and because of that, the guy filed a case of slander by deed. No? And she raised the defense of avoidance of greater evil. What is the greater evil? The greater evil is inter entering into a loveless marriage. So, in this case, uh, accused can be acquitted of the crime of slander by deed. No? After all the wedding preparations with the offended party were made. Since uh, there was a necessity on, on the part of the accused to avoid going to a loveless marriage with the offended party. But she can be liable of, of, for civil liability. Fifth, under the justifying circumstance, fulfillment of duty or lawful exercise of right or office. Uh, <clears throat> Requisites. Number one, the accused acted in the performance of uh, a duty or in the lawful exercise of right. Let me check on... Uh, yeah. I can show you the codal provision that we are now in number uh, we, we finished with number four no, we are now about to discuss on paragraph uh, five any person who acted uh, in the who acts in the fulfillment of a duty or the lawful exercise of a right lawful duty or exercise of one's right <clears throat> um the accused acted in the performance of a duty or in the lawful exercise of a right. And that 
uh, the injured uh, uh, the injury caused or the offense committed be the necessary consequence of the due performance or the lawful exercise of one's right. <clears throat> So, uh, papasok dito yung Article 429, the doctrine of self-help. So, the owner of the, or possessor of a thing has the right to exclude any, pers any person from the enjoyment and disposal thereof. For, the, uh, for this purpose, uh, he can use reasonable force necessary to prevent or repel an actual or threatened unlawful physical invasion or usurpation of his property. Yeah. It is not necessary that there must be uh, a lawful aggression against a person charged with the protection of the property. If there is a lawful aggression against the person charged with the protection of the property, ang mag apply dyan ay paragraph 1 ng Article 11. It being the defense of a right to property. No. Let's let's uh, quote some uh, suggested answers here. No, in one case, ang sagot sa bar question is that the accused did not incur a uh, criminal liability because his act of firing at the real wheel of the car to stop the vehicle and pre prevent uh, P from taking away his car is neither done in dolo daw or in culpa. The act does not constitute a crime. It is reasonable exercise of his right to prevent or repel an actual physical invasion. In one uh, bar exams, the suggested answer is here. It's not he a is not criminally liable. Young service pistol was not was notched by another person. A was only in the lawful exercise of a right in trying to regain its possession. And there was no uh, negligence on his part. Another bar question, but uh, uh, suggested answer in a bar question, but not constituting fulfillment of a duty. Uh, sabi ng suggested answer is that uh, the defense of the police is not uh, tenable now. Kasi yung defense of having acted in the fulfillment of a duty uh, requires that. Uh, it is not enough now that they acted act, that the accused acted in the fulfillment of duty because in this case after the victim was shot in the right leg and he was already crawling there was no need again for that uh, policeman to shoot him further now clearly that policeman he acted beyond the call of duty you know, which was the uh, cause of the death of the victim so let's go to number 6 any person who acts in obedience to an order issued by a superior for some lawful purpose. Requisite, requisites. Order by a superior order by a superior. Order must be for some lawful uh, purpose. The means used by the subordinate uh, to, carry, to carry that such order is lawful. In other words, uh, lawful order lawful means huh? but the persons who give the order and the person who executed it must be acting within the limitations prescribed by law but even if the order is illegal if it is patently legal and the subordinate is not uh, aware of its illeg illegality the subordinate is not uh, liable as I mentioned a while ago but in one case, the, when the person, when the military officer instructed or ordered his subordinates to kill their prisoner of war, and they followed you know, the, the, their boss, the, 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 their officer, can they claim obedience to an order? No, it's, no, they cannot because they know that the order is patently unlawful because every soldier should know that there is no justification to kill uh, at no instance can a prisoner of war be killed they know that as soldier no under geneva convention 
Let's go to exempting circumstances. Okay. Yun. Uh, the exemption from punishment is based on the complete absence of intelligence, freedom of action or intent, or uh, absence of negligence on the part of the accused. Uh, in exempting circumstances, there is a crime, but there is no criminal liability exists. Imbecility. How do you distinguish that from insanity? Imbecile is ex ex exempt from crime in all cases. Sa lahat ng pagkakataon. No criminal liability. Why? Because an imbecile is one who, who, while advanced in age, has a mental development comparable to that of children between two and seven years of age. Uh, while insanity is not, uh, insane person is not exempt if it can be uh, proven that he acted uh, during a lucid interval or during the lucid interval, the insane acts with intelligence. Question ngayon, sino ang may burden to prove insanity? Who has the burden to prove or to show insanity? The defense must show or must prove that the accused was insane at the time of the commission of the crime because the perception is always in favor of sanity. How much evidence is necessary to overthrow the presumption of uh, sanity? When a person was insane at the time of the commission of the felony, he is exempt from criminal liability. Lumalabas sa bar to. Pagka insane siya at the time of the commission, walang problema. Pero kung sane siya, sane at the time of the commission of the crime, Pero he became insane only later after the commission of the crime or during trial, he is criminally liable. Ang consequence, mas suspend lang ang trial. No? Kung naging insane siya at the time of trial, but sane at the time of the commission of the crime, he can be, he is liable. Okay? So the evidence of sanity must refer to the time preceding the act under prosecution or the, the very moment of its execution. Let's go to number four. Uh, performing a lawful act, no accident, requisites, performing a lawful act, do care, exercise with do care, it causes injury to another by mere accident at dapat walang fault or intent of causing the same. So what is an accident? Uh, an accident is something that out happens outside the way of our will. And although it comes about through some act of our will, lies beyond the bounds of humanly foreseeable consequences. So if the consequences are plainly foreseeable, it will be a case of negligence. Remember this one, no? uh, irresistible force, um, irresistible force, there's, uh, the, the force must be a physical force. It must come from a third person and that it must be irresistible force. So it's not a threat. No? Hindi katulad ng paragraph 6. No? Kasi ito, merong physical force being exerted. No, katulad ng pagbayo ng ng baril sa sa head ng isang ng ng isang uh, accused and because and the accused was required to kill his companion otherwise he will continue na to hit his head uh is exempted from criminal liability because of very irresistible force but with respect to uncontrollable fear of an equal or greater injury, uh, that's another thing. No? There must be a threat. Number one, there must be a threat which causes the fear of an great evil uh, greater than or at least equal to that which is required to commit. No? And it promises of an evil with such gravity and imminence that ordinary man would have succumbed to it. No? Basis of duress as a valid defense, no? 
It must be based on real imminent reasonable fear for one's life or limb. And it should not be inspired by only a speculation or a uh, or, or remote fear. How do we distinguish the two, these two? As I've said, sa paragraph five, mayroong physical force. Sa paragraph six, no, employs intimidation or threat in compelling another to commit a crime. Okay? Basis of paragraph six, no, uh, under uh, uncontrollable feel, an act done by me against my will is not my act. An act done by me against my will is not my act. Actus me in detail, factus than s may use actus. And lastly, number seven, no? when prevented by some lawful or insuperable cause, no? that the requisites, uh, the act is required by law to be done, person fails to perform such act, its failure to perform was done by, was due to some uh, lawful or inseparable cause. So a person who arrested uh, a, a police officer who, press, who arrested a suspect no, in the mountain, and there's no means of uh, uh, transportation in going down. No, you know that a person may be liable for arbitrary detention because he has to deliver, uh, to file a case against him, you know, uh, delivered to a judicial authority within the number of hours required by law. And if he fails to uh, do that because there is no means of transportation, uh, then uh, he can raise this uh, as uh, to accept him from criminal liability. <clears throat> Merong lumabas na mga bar questions dyan. No, yung, uh, if he was not insane at the time of the commission of the crime. No. The facts of the case, however, indicate that uh, the accused acted or committed the crime with discernment. So, yun ang mga ano, no, analysis in a particular bar question. Yung isa, sabi niya, the court is correct in ruling out insanity as an extending circumstance uh, while there was a testimony that A was suffering from a mental disorder. The testimony of A's father disclosed that A had lucid interval. No? And because what is presumed is insanity, not insanity, it is to be presumed that A, A was insane when he committed the crime. When a person uses uh, a high-powered uh, M16 rifle and use it for hunting, uh, he committed a crime of illegal possession of firearms as he does not appear to have either a license. Though. And furthermore, that it is a high-powered, uh, he was negligent in not seeing that bullets fired from his gun may ricochet. Let's go to mitigating circumstances. How do you differentiate? I tolomala basabar. So you have to uh, remember this. Mitigating and aggravating. Kinds. You have ordinary and you have privilege. Aggravating. You have generic. You have specific you have uh, qualifying 
and you have number four, inherent. So let's go to mitigating circumstances. Uh, uh, two kinds of mitigating. You have ordinary and privilege. Ordinary, uh, if present, no, and no generic aggravating circumstance, it will re reduce the penalty to its minimum period. While in privilege mitigating, no, if present, uh, the penalty will be reduced by one or two degrees lower. Another difference between the two, in ordinary mitigating, it can be offset by any generic aggravating. In privilege, it cannot be offset by any aggravating circumstance. Okay. Now, aggravating circumstances. We've got generic, if present without any mitigating, would increase the penalty to its maximum period. No? Period. Pag sinabi period, sa ibig sabihin, applicable ang generic to divisible penalties as well as ordinary. No? Specific, it applies to particular uh, crimes. Qualifying, it changes the nature of the crime. Like murder, uh, homicide. If uh, the qualifying aggravating circumstances under Article 248 are present, such as treachery, evident premeditation, and the others, the crime would not be homicide aggravated, but it's murder because it's used as a qualifying aggravating. Inherent, inherent in the commission of the crime. Robbery in uh, evident premeditation. Evident premeditation is inherent in the crime of robbery. Um, uh, in uh, malversation, uh, abuse of public position is inherent. Inherent. What's what's the important is that in the rule of a setting, you only offset between an ordinary from that of a generic aggravating circumstance. No? The only between these two. Privilege you do not offset. No. Why? Because once you see the privilege, no, you lower it down by one or two degrees, usually by one. Kung nakita niyo circumstances, they have ordinary mitigating, generic aggravating, privilege mitigating. What you do once you see a privilege, you lower it down. No, by degree. Then you apply the rule of offsetting. And the rule only applies between an ordinary and generic aggravating. Uh, you, ordinary cannot offset specific. It cannot offset a qualifying. It cannot offset an inherent one to increase the penalty's maximum period. So, limbawa, the use of fire, no, it cannot be offset because it's a crime in itself. No? Uh, as I mentioned, you abuse of public position, you do not increase the penalty to its maximum period when the crime is malversation because abuse of public positions is inherent in uh, the crime of malversation. No? So, robbery with force upon things, evident premeditation cannot be upset no? by any ordinary mitigating. Why? Because it's inherent. Na yan, eh. So, dapat no, you know how to distinguish. Do not immediately offset once you see an aggravating. Make sure that it's a generic aggravating. And make sure that also it's an ordinary mitigating because it's a privilege. Automatically, you lower the penalty. Okay, uh, let's continue. Kailangan medyo bilisan natin. <clears throat> the first one, incomplete self-defense. Okay, incomplete. No? Uh, what's the first one? Uh, 
incomplete uh, justifying like uh, incomplete self defense unlawful three requisites no? as we mentioned kanina unlawful aggression reasonable necessity lack of sufficient provocation if unlawful aggression is present treat it only as an ordinary mitigating but if unlawful aggression is present plus reasonable necessity o kaya uh, lack of sufficient provocation one and two and one and three it becomes a privilege mitigating and when it becomes a privilege mitigating you lower it down by a degree no it cannot be offset by uh, any generic aggravating so pag one and two and one and three are present it cannot be offset lower it down by degree so you have to analyze the bar problem pag nakita mo one and two one and three privilege yan, baba mo ay one degree. Pag unlawful aggression lang yan, at, and you see an aggravate, generic aggravating, it can be offset. But if it's two which is present, it has no bearing. No, It will not lower the penalty. If only three is present or lack of sufficient provocation, uh, it's immaterial. It has no bearing. Or if two or even if two or three are present without any unlawful aggression, no, it will not affect the pen the penalty. It will not lessen the penalty because unlawful aggression is the uh, indispensable requisite. When you talk about my minority, uh, minority, if the is minority a mitigating is minority and accepting circumstance it depends don't uh, don't say that it's automatically an accepting minority can either be uh, an accepting and it could either be a mitigating If the age of the child, number one, is 15 years old or below, when you say 15, birthday niya. Because if, if his age is 15 years old and one day, that's already above 15. No? So 15 or below, total exemption. You don't, you don't even have to determine whether he acted with or without discernment. Second, if the age of the child is above 15 and below 18, no, it's exempting if we acted without discernment. If he does not know the consequences of his act, above 15 or 15 days, uh, 15 years old and one day and below 18, just a day before his uh, birthday, 18th birthday, and if he acted without this discernment, he's exempted or that he does not know the consequences of his act. But if the child is above 15 or, or below 18, no, above 15, below 18, uh, and he acted with discernment, he is criminally liable. No? It is not exam, exam, exempting. But if he acted with discernment, it will be deemed as a privilege mitigating and he is entitled to lessen the penalty, not in its minimum period, but uh, by a degree. Let's continue. No intention, number three, no intention to commit so grave or wrong. It refers to preter intentionem. No? The injury is greater than that uh, he intended. Number four, sufficient provocation. No provocation must be sufficient. It must originate from the offended party. Provocation must be immediate to the act. No? Uh, Immediate means no interval of time. Sometimes when this is asked in the bar, uh, you differentiate paragraph four from paragraph five. Paragraph four, sufficient provocation 
on the part of the offended party immediately preceding the act. So there's a word immediate. Number five, if you notice, the act was committed in the immediate temptation. So both paragraphs four and five use, use immediate, the word immediate. But number four, as uh, contemplated immediate therein, is that there is no interval of time. When you talk about immediate under paragraph five, which is immediate vindication of a grave offense, no, uh, means proximate. There can be an interval of time may lapse from the commission of the grave offense to the commission of the crime in vindication. So remember that. What else is the difference between the four and the five? It, uh, aside from uh, proximate and not proximate. Okay, uh, there, under number five, there could be a grave offense. Under number four, wala. Grave offense that can be done against himself or against his relatives. The relatives no, up is only up to relatives by affinity within the same degree. It does not mention about relatives within uh, by consanguinity within the fourth civil degree. So remember that. No? Uh, grave offense may not be can be may not be a crime no? it could be for as long as something wrong is committed against uh, the family or against himself okay what else uh there are a lot of questions here huh? as an immediate vindication no? uh Alimbawa, one was asked, no, W allowed a man to have sex with her thinking that she was her husband. Tapos na he, he, she realized that the man was not her husband. So she stabbed him to death. No? Kaya lang tapos na. No? So, anong, so hindi na justifying. It can be mitigating. What type of mitigating? Immediate vindication of a grave offense. No? Uh, Another question, kung itatanong sa bar, ito lang yun. No? It cannot be validly invoked, kaga, it cannot, uh, the accused cannot validly invoke defense of his daughter's honor in having killed uh, B since the rape was already consummated and moreover B already ran away. So there was no aggression to speak of, no defense of, uh, uh, of honor, but he can in, he can invoke, however, the benefit of the mitigating circumstance of immediate vindication of a grave offense to a descendant, to a descendant. No? Next, passion and obfuscation. Uh, having acted upon an impulse so powerful as natural to have produced passion and obfuscation, uh, Kailangan no passion of obfuscation after 24 hours or several hours. No? Kasi dapat yung the said act which produced the obfuscation was not far removed from the commission of the crime by a considerable length of time. Um, dapat ang passion of obfuscation, we know this, it must arise from a lawful sentiment. A legitimate feeling. So, merong illegitimate feeling. So, if the a husband, no, he has a wife, and then he has a girlfriend, and then yung girlfriend niya <coughs> nagbetray sa kanya, went with another man, he killed the, 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 this girl, can he raise passion and obfuscation in killing this girl because she loved this, this girl so much, but uh, more than uh, he loves his wife? No, he cannot. Because it arises from his illegitimate feeling not from a lawful sentiment no <clears throat> now uh, magkaiba yung ano passion of obfuscation from irresistible force passion of obfuscation mitigating lang yan irresistible force is an exempting okay voluntary surrender to whom to uh uh ted pylon hindi Kasi you can only uh, surrender to a person in authority or an agent of a person in authority. Second, the surrender must be voluntary. Third, he, he has not 
the offender had not been actually arrested. So the surrender must be, again, to a person in authority or an agent of a person in authority. Hindi pwede ke montulpo. Ang voluntary surrender, he acknowledges his guilt. He wishes uh, to save time and trouble and expense in, in searching him and capturing him. Kung if it's just a matter of time, kahit hindi siya nag-surrender, eh pero mahuhuli rin siya, this will not be considered. If his purpose is only to verify to the police station, uh, kung it is true that he heard the news that he is wanted by authorities, not voluntary surrender. No? Uh, question, voluntary surrender is a mitigating circumstance in all acts and omissions punishable by the RPC. True or false? It's false because of voluntary surrender may not be appreciated in case of criminal negligence okay plea of guilt plea of guilt it must be spontaneous confession in open court maraming bar problem dito no it should be done in open court or before the competent court that is to try the case and of course the confession must be made prior to the presentation of the evidence for the prosecution <clears throat> Plea of guilt on appeal cannot be mitigating. Plea of guilt at the preliminary investigation is no plea at all. And of course, the uh, confession of guilt must be made in open court no? and not an extrajudicial confession. Plea of guilt. Uh, may mga questions. Let me, baka may tanong sa bar. Eh. Let, allow me to quote some uh, suggested answers. Yung, he entered his, his plea of guilt before the RTC can be considered now as spontaneous because th that is the court trying his case. But his plea of guilt in the MPC, which is uh, conducting a preliminary investigation only, it cannot be considered because it is not a court no, competent to render judgment. Hindi pwede kay fiscal o hindi pwede sa MPC conducting a preliminary investigation. It should be the, uh, the court no? which uh, can render a judgment. Uh, pwede bang mag plea of guilt sa, uh, when, when the crime charge is uh, illegal possession of firearms? As I've said, hindi because it's a special penal law. Remember the de basic difference between an SPL from that of the RPC. Neither is plea of guilt a mitigating circumstance because a confession of guilt must be done uh, before the prosecution had started to present its evidence, not after. Okay, plea, uh, number nine, number eight, uh, physical defect, deaf, dumb, blind, physical Defect must restrict his means of action, defense, or communication of his fellow being. Physical defect is such as being harnessed or crippled, whereby his means to act or defend himself or communicate with his fellow beings are limited. So the nature of the offense to be considered uh, as such is dapat uh, uh, it would affect his means to act, defend, or communicate with his fellow beings. Uh, alimbawa, uh, yung bang commission ng blind ng estafa by misappropriating, uh, entrusted by a friend for safekeeping, entitled him to mitigating, hindi. Di ba? Hmm, no, walang kinalaman ng pagiging blind niya. Sa crime of treason, hindi rin. We're not mitigating. No? If he commits the crime of injuries, a crippled man, pepede, no? Illness. Illness must diminish, number nine, uh, the exercise of his willpower. And it must not deprive him of the consciousness of his acts. 
when the offender completely lost the exercise of a willpower, it may be an exempting circumstance. Okay. Analogous. Uh, analogous over 60 years of age with failing eyesight, similar to over 70 years of age. Uh, outrage, outrage feeling of creditor, similar to passion of uh, passion and obfuscation. Uh, impulse of jealous uh, feeling, similar to passion of obfuscation. Voluntary restitution of stolen property, similar to voluntary surrender. Extreme uh, poverty and necessity, similar to, to incomplete justification based on state of necessity. Condition of running amok, nag-amok siya. No, not mitigating. Okay, let's go to aggravating circumstances. We only have a few. Uh, kaya pa. Uh, Gaya ng sinabi ko, as I mentioned to you, just concentrate when when it's when we're already in the rule of upsetting, you only apply the generic aggravating circumstance to offset an ordinary mitigating. Do not apply specific, do not apply qualifying, do not apply inherent because they cannot be offset by any uh, uh, ordinary mitigating circumstances. No? Let's go to advantage be taken of his public position. Titignan nyo lang, it should be generic, generic aggravating, not inherent. Okay. So as I've said, this is uh, inherent in the crime of malversation or bribery. Do not use it uh, to offset a, a, a generic, uh, ordinary mitigating. It will not be low. It will not lower the penalty. Uh, it will not increase the penalty to its maximum period. Advantage. Ang tanong lang dito, did the accused use his public position in order to commit the crime? If yes, no, the, unless it's inherent or other aggravating though, then appreciate the same. If he did not use or did not take advantage of his public position, and th then this is not to be appreciated. Okay. That second, uh, the crime be in contempt or with or with insult to the public authority. Dapat yung public authority is engaged in the exercise of his function. That he who is thus engaged in the exercise of some function is not the person against whom the crime is committed. No, ang public and the offender knows him to be a public authority. And his presence has not prevented the offender from committing the crime. Pag sinabing ano, public authority, sino ito? No, it, is some, it is called a person in authority. So one is directly vested with jurisdiction. So kung sa police officer, it, the crime was committed in the presence of the police officer, hindi, this is not applicable. And dapat, and dapat kilala and the... Uh, the offender knows that he is a public a person in authority and it did not dissuade him from committing a crime. Bawa si barangay chairman, inawat niya si A and B sa barangay niya. Yet A killed B in the presence of the barangay chairman. This is to be, this is applicable. No? Now, if, if, if the assault is directed against the, the barangay chairman, then this is not an aggravating anymore. That is a crime already, direct assault. So again, do not appreciate this when the, it is committed in the presence of that agent of a person in authority only. Hmm. And knowledge that a public authority is present is essential. Number three, insult due to wrong age or sex or the crime is committed in the dwelling. This is applicable only to crimes against persons or, or honor. The circumstance of rank, age, or sex may be taken into account only against persons or honor. With insult or disregard, there must be evidence that in committing the crime, the accused deliberately intended to offend or insult the sex or age of the offended party. 
Fourth, uh, the act be committed with grave abuse of confidence or ungratefulness. No? Uh, Adam muna. Uh, dwelling muna. Dwelling. Uh, dwelling. The owner of the dwelling who gave the provocation. What if the owner of the dwelling is the one who gave the immediate provoca uh, provocation? Dwelling is not aggravating in this case. Prosecution must prove that no provocation was given by the offended party. Also, even if the offender did not enter the dwelling, this circumstance is ap applicable. So, alimbawa, although the trigger man fired the shot from outside the house and the victim was inside, then it is still applicable. It is enough that the victim was attacked inside the house, although the assailant may have devised means to perpetrate the assault from outside. So dwelling is aggravating even if, if the offender did not enter the upper part of the house where the victim was, but shot from under the house. Pwede yun. Even kahit na killing took place outside the dwelling, sa labas na, but provided that the commission of the crime was begun in the dwelling, nagsimula sa loob ng bahay, napatay outside the house, still uh, appreciated. When the victim had two houses in which he used to live, the commission of the crime in any of them is attended by this one. Pero, Dwelling is not aggravating in this instance where both the offender and the par uh, offended party are occupants of the same house. And this is even true if the offender is a servant in the house. Second, when the robbery is committed by the use of force upon things, dwelling is not aggravating. Bakit? Kasi it is already inherent. Dwelling is inherent sa robbery with the use of force upon things. In the crime of trespass sa dwelling, tatandaan nyo, inherit ito. Huwag nyo nang i-increase sa penalty to its maximum period. Do not use this to upset an ordinary mitigating. No? When the owner of the dwelling, as I've said, is uh, gave the, the provocation, and uh, do not appreciate this. When the, uh, this is present, when the husband killed his a strange wife in the house occupied by her, other than the conjugal home. Abuse of confidence. Number four, that the party had trusted the offender and the uh, uh, offender abused such trust by committing a crime against the offended party. Abuse of confidence must facilitate the commission of the crime. Pag hindi na officially uh, na facilitate um, the commission of the crime, then do not do not uh, appreciate this one. More problem. Important the confidence between the offender and the offended party must be immediate and personal. Immediate and personal. No, the one who offended who, who had been uh, the of uh, the the of the offender must offend the offended party, not the other person. Mbawa, the father entrusted his child to his best friend, who is a minor, and the father went abroad. His best friend molested his child. Question, is there abuse of confidence? No, because uh, again, as I've said, it must be immediate and personal. Who is the person offended? Is it the father or the child? It's the child. It, it, between the child and his, uh, the father's best friend, is there a trust and confidence? In no. So it should be the, uh, the it should be the father who should be offended by 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 his best friend and not uh, the child. Abuse of confidence in, in, inherent in some felonies and do not appreciate that. Inherent in malversation, inherent in misappropriation and qualified seduction. Okay, number five. 
uh, committed in a palace or place dedicated to religious worship, the place where public authorities are engaged in the discharge of their duties, uh, distinguished from contempt or insult to public authorities. In both instances, public authorities are in the performance of their duties, but under paragraph 5, the public authorities who are in the performance of their duties must be in their office. Don't sa paragraph 2, which we discussed earlier, they're not performing, uh, uh, they're performing outside of their office. In paragraph 2, the public authority should not be the offended party. Dito sa paragraph 5, he may be the offended party. Now notice dito, no? uh, in the place dedicated to a religious word, uh, worship, no? or in the palace of the chief executive, place lang ito. No? Hindi, hindi na kinakailangan ng official or religious functions that is necessary. Number six, nighttime, an inhabited place. Or uh, ban, NUB. Dapat it should facilitate the commission of the crime or especially thought for. No? Nighttime to be appreciated, aggravating, facilitated FES, uh, facilitated the commission of the crime, specially sought uh, for by the, offended, uh, by the offender and took advantage thereof. Uh, pag, de, pag hindi naman, they did not take advantage of it, wala. Hmm. Nighttime darkness, the period of darkness beginning at the end and thus. No, uh, night, uh, not aggravating when crime began at day, at daytime. Dapat the commission of the crime must begin and this must be accomplished under the concealment of darkness. It must be accomplished during nighttime. And that the offense must be actually committed in the darkness of the night. An inhabited place. It's not. It's not uh, the distance, but whether or not the place of the commission of the offense, there was a reasonable uh, possibility of receiving help. No, possibility of the victim receiving some help. What is a ban? Whenever more than three armed malefactors shall have to get acted together in the commission of an offense. More than three, so there should be at least four. No, if one of the four armed persons is a principal by inducement, they do not form a ban. Oh. By a ban is aggravating against property or against persons or in the crime of illegal detention or treason. This is not applicable to crimes against chastity. No, and uh. By a ban is also inherent sa brigandage. No? Occasion of uh, seven, conflagration number seven, offender must take advantage of the calamity or misfortune. Yun lang, he took advantage. If it's just a coincidence, it's just casual, no, hindi. Dapat, he should take advantage of the calamity or misfortune. Number eight, aid of our men. No? Yung accused availed himself of their aid or relied upon them. Kung casual presence lang near the commission of the crime, hindi magko-constitute. No? Kung pareho silang armed, hindi mag, hindi, hindi, this will not be considered. Ah. What else? Uh, a recidivist. Who is a recidivist? Uh, um, previously convicted by final judgment of another crime. Uh, what is controlling is at the time of trial, no? not at the time of the commission of the crime. No? At the time of the trial, no? hindi yung commission of the crime, uh, time of the commission of the crime. It is not required that at the time of the commission of the crime, the accused should have been previously convicted by 
uh, final judgment of another crime. And when you say previously convicted by final judgment, no, uh, um, it must be the present crime and the previous crime must be embraced in the same title of the code. No? Pardon does not obliterate the fact that the accused was a recidivist, but amnesty extinguishes the penalty and its effect. Talk about number 10, reiteration, previously served sentence. Oh, ito naman, served sentence. How do you distinguish recidivism from reiteration? Itong reiteration, it is necessary that the offender should have served out his sentence for the first offense. In recidivism, it is, all, all, it is enough that the final judgment has been rendered in the first offense. Second, in reiteration, the previous and subsequent offenses must not be embraced in the same title of the code. In recidivism, as I've said, it must be embraced in the same title of the code. Third, reiteration is not always an aggravating circumstance, whereas Recidivism is always to be taken into account in fixing the penalty to be imposed. Price, reward, or promise, it presupposes the concurrence of the two offenders. The price or the reward or the promise must be the purpose, uh, must be for the purpose of inducing another to perform the deed. By number 12, the crime be committed by means of inundation, fire, etc. Um, the unless used by the offender as a means to accomplish a criminal purpose, any of the circumstances in article paragraph 12 cannot be considered or appreciated to increase the penalty. Dapat yan ito ay used by the offender to accomplish a criminal purpose. Evident premeditation. Uh, it must be evident. Premeditation must be evident and not merely suspected. Requisites, TAL, the time that she uh, determined to commit the crime. A, act manifestly showing that he clung to his determination to commit the crime. He has the opportunity to meditate or reflect Upon the consequences of his act, letter L, sufficient lapse of time between the determination and execution of the crime. So, importante, the time and date when the offender determined to commit the crime, they are essential. Ano mga example? Yung crime was carefully planned by the offenders nag previously prepared the means when they considered adequate to carry out Yung, yung, yung grave, uh, pre-prepare na nila, no? uh, pag pinatay nila kung saan nila lilibing. Okay? When the defendant uh, com already commenced to sharpen his bolo in the afternoon, the night before he committed the crime. No? Those are examples. Oh. When the victim is different from that intended, premed, evident premeditation is not aggravating. Treachery. Treachery, important ito. Uh, even when we talk, uh, when we discuss uh, murder, because it's a qualifying uh, circumstance of murder, treachery, among others. Of course, evident premeditation and the uh, yung iba pa. Mode of attack, dalawa lang. The attack must be sudden and unexpected. No, the attack must be sudden and unexpected, such as the uh, victim had no opportunity to defend himself. Victim had no opportunity to defend himself because the attack is sudden and unexpected. Number two, it must be consciously and deliberately adopted to ensure its execution. These two must concur. Hindi pa pwedeng isa lang. The mode of attack must be consciously and deliberately adopted to ensure its execution. 
to eliminate self-defense on the part of the victim. So, uh, so the mode of attack must be thought of by the offender. It must not spring from the unexpected turn of events. So, kung ang decision niya is only a spur of the moment, it was sudden. There's no treachery. No? O kaya, ang meeting between the accused and the victim is casual lang. No? In the, in, it's, it's not also considered. So, anong mga examples ng ano, not uh, opportunity to defend himself? Like, attack is sudden. No? We're in the act of shaking hands and then all of a sudden, it was stabbed by the, by the uh, accused. Or when the person was texting, stabbed also by the uh, accused. No? But there's no treachery when the victim was already defending himself when he was effect, when he was uh, attacked by the victim. And where, where, where he was given a chance to prepare himself. No? Such as there was a challenge to a gunfight. No? no treachery also when it was preceded by a warning. Or shooting is preceded by a heated argumentation, argumentation, or discussion. Okay, or a phrase ang uh, a hands niya, there is treachery. Treachery in killing a uh, there is also treachery in killing a child. Can there be treachery even if the attack is face to face? Yes. If it is sudden and unexpected, no opportunity to, to defend himself, and it should be cautiously and deliberately adopted. No? Uh, what you have to to remember here is what are the what are the circumstances where treachery can absorb. No, what circumstances treachery may absorb? Treachery may absorb abuse of superior strength, aid of armed men, by a band, means to weaken of defense. Pag nagsama-sama yan, ilalagay mo na sa treachery. Nighttime, treachery, absorbed by treachery. What about craft? Absorbed by treachery. Age and sex, absorbed by treachery. But dwelling is not included no, in treachery. Uh, treachery is inherent in uh, murder by poisoning. Of course, treachery cannot exist, coexist with passion or obfuscation. Okay, ignominy. When you talk about ignominy, unang adyo uh, is that um, merong uh, the purpose is to humiliate to put the victim to shame the offended party so when they were required when uh, the wife was uh, raped in the presence of the uh, husband or when they were required uh, the offended party the victim were required uh, to kneel down before the uh, accused dati lang nilang trabahador yung accused and the, and and this person shot these two persons, young husband and wife, applicable to crimes against chastity, less serious physical injuries, and light or grave coercion, ignominy, and murder, of course. You know? uh, in one case, I've been Supreme Court, um, there is ignominy when in compelling the old woman to confess to the theft of clothes the accused maltreated her and took off her drawers. No? Uh, the purpose is to put her to shame. A lawful entry uh, to effect entrance and not for escape. By means of motor vehicle number 20, uh, motor vehicle was used in facilitating the escape. It should not be an aggravating circumstance. Uh, what is cruelty? Cruelty, uh, physical pain. No? When uh, cruelty enjoys and delights in making his victim suffer slowly and gradually. 
causing him unnecessary physical pain in the commission of the act. So cruelty, there's physical pain. Uh, ignominy, there's uh, emotional or uh, the purpose is to humiliate the victim. Be deliberately augmented by a uh, cause causing other wrong disgrace means that the accused at the time of the commission of the crime had a deliberate intention to prolong the suffering of the victim. Okay. Relationship uh, is taken into account when the offended party is the spouse, ascendants, descendants. Alternative circumstances no, may, may be taken as aggravating or mitigating according to the nature and effects of the crime, other conditions. So there are RIDE, relationship, uh, intoxication, degree of instruction, and communication. Relationship of stepfather or stepmother, stepson, stepdaughter included by analogy here. No? Relationship is mitigating in crimes against property by analogy, but in theft, estafa, and malicious mischief, relationship is exempting. Uh, relationship is aggravating in crimes against persons if the offended party is a relative of higher degree or when the offender and the offended party are relatives of the same degree. But if the relationship is an element of the crime, Katulad ng parricide, do not uh, appreciate this. It's neither aggravating or mitigating. In crimes against chastity, always aggravating, regardless of higher or lower degree. Okay, what else? Uh, intoxication. Intoxication is mitigating if not habitual or not subsequent to the plan to commit a felony. Aggravating if intoxication is uh, habitual and subsequent or intentional, no? subsequent to the commission of the crime. Degree of, well, ang tatanda nyo lang, it is intentional when the offend, even if it's not habitual, Pero intoxication is used to embolden him to commit the crime, then uh, this is appreciated. Degree of instruction and education, law of degree of instruction and education or lack of it is generally mitigating. High degree of instruction, education is aggravating when the offender avails himself of learning. No? Lack of sufficient uh, intelligence uh, is required in illiteracy. Ibig sabihin, uh, illiteracy alone no, is not, uh, ca ca cannot be uh, appreciated. No? But it should also be because of lack of sufficient intelligence no? to invoke the, uh, this alternative circumstance of lack of instruction. So it's not mitigating in crimes against uh, property. So kung uh, illiterate ka, grade 1 ka, grade 2, no? Not mitigating. Not mitigating also in crimes against chastity. No one is so ignorant as not to know that the crime of rape is wrong and in violation of the law. Lack of education and instruction is not mitigating in the crime of murder. Degree of instruction is aggravating when the offender availed himself or took advantage of it in committing the crime. Okay, let's have a break. Uh, next, um, after the break, we will be discussing the indeterminate sentence law and we'll go into book two. Let's have a five minute break.
Pero ba tayo mag-extend ng 30 minutes? Just in case lang. Okay, can we continue now?
Okay, can we proceed now? Okay. So we will go now to the indeterminate sentence law. Anong dapat tandaan lang sa islaw? Islaw, the law mandates that um, to impose the maximum and minimum term of the indeterminate sentence. No? Mandated ang bawat court to impose the maximum term and min, uh, minimum term of the indeterminate sentence. <clears throat> what you have to remember, if this will be asked in the bar, dalawa lang yan. It's either um, on the disqualifications and the computation. So you'll have to memorize the, the disqualification under the indeterminate sentence law and know the formula on how, how to secure the minimum term and the maximum term of the indeterminate sentence. So, unang una, ito, let me share. Here. Ano muna yung ano? Purposes of indeterminate sentence. Lumabas minsan sa bar yan. Well, to uplift and redeem valuable human and material uh, uh, prevent unnecessary excessive jurisdiction of personal liberty and economic usefulness. It is intended to favor the accused particularly to shorten his term of imprisonment depending upon his behavior and physical, mental, moral record as prisoner. Okay, if a special penal law question adopts the penalties under the RPC, will the indeterminate sentence apply just as it would in felonies? Yes, like as I've mentioned before, RA 7610, which is child abuse, is a special, special penal law, yet it adapts the nomenclature of penalties of the RPC. So therefore, in determining in determining the maximum term and minimum term of the indeterminate sentence, you will have to use the formula no, for the RPC and not that of the SPL. So, magkakaroon ka din ng uh, rule of setting, of mitigating and aggravating because you use the formula of the RPC, although child abuse is a special penal law. Uh, these are the things that you have to memorize. No, no um, punished by death or life imprisonment or reclusion perpetua. Do not interchange the disqualifications under probation law from that of Islam. In probation law, if the penalty uh, uh, exceeds six years, ito hindi punishes. Offenses punishable by death or life imprisonment or reclusion perpetua by analogy. No? So in death and reclusion perpetua, if it's an RPC, in the, in, ano, indivisible penalties. So this will not be applied, up, ISLA will not apply to indivisible penalties. Or those convicted of treason, conspiracy to propose uh, or propose to com, uh, proposal to commit treason. Treason, ano ba treason? Uh, there is a breach of allegiance by a person who owes uh, an allegiance to the state by levying war or adherence to the enemy, giving them aid and comfort. Conspiracy and conspiracy to commit treason. When two or more persons come to an agreement concerning the commission of a treason and they decide to commit treason, Proposal, when a person who decided to commit treason proposes it to another. Misprision of treason, when, when a person has knowledge of conspiracy to commit treason and he fails to disclose it to the proper authority. Rebellion, there's a rebellion. There, the purpose is to overthrow the government. There is a public uprising and taking arms against the, the government. Sedition. 
there is a public tumultuous uprising. No? Uh, it's political. It could also be social. What in, while in rebellion, it's purely uh, political. Espionage, di ba? in times of uh, uh, peace and in times of war, espionage is uh, it's like a James Bond. He went to the naval, naval, military uh, establishment in order to, to, to secure confidential inform information. Or if it's a public official and they disclose it to a representative of another or of a foreign country. Those convicted of piracy, it's, uh, it's, there's intent to gain. It's like uh, robbery, but only in, in, in high seas or in Philippine waters. No? Uh, seizing the vessel or its, or its belonging. Habitual delinquents. If within a period of 10 years, reckoned from where? Last release or uh, uh, niya, no? he commits the crime of uh, uh, serious, the serious physical injuries, robbery, theft, estafa, falsification. How many times? A third time or offender uh, within 10 years from his last release or last conviction. And six, th those who escape from confinement or those who evaded sentence. No? Seven, those granted with conditional pardon and he violated the same. And eight, those whose maximum period of imprisonment that should not exceed one year. Or, or, or those already serving final judgment upon approval of this act. Memorize all of this. Kasi, uh, if the disqualification is present, you don't have to compute. If there is, if there is rebellion, then you don't even have to compute. If there is piracy, don't compute. If you escape from prison or evaded the sentence, uh, uh, don't ever compute. And do not, uh, well, probation is not included, but do not uh, apply the disqualifications of probation here. When a person has already filed an appeal, no, that's not a disqualification here. Or if a crime, if uh, he committed the crime of uh, against national security, do not no uh, forget about probation. It's not included. Okay, so let's go down uh, specifically on how to compute. As as I've said, the first disqualification. Uh, is that if the penalty is reclusion perpetua or death. So kung nakita nyo yung reclusion perpetua, perpetua or death, mag nyo ng compute. Because it has its own uh, formula, no? If it's a single, indivisible penalty. And two indivisible penalty. Pag sinabing uh, two indivisible, indivisible penalties, it does not have any periods. It does not have uh, medium, minimum, or maximum periods. So if you have reclusion perpetua uh, or death, Reclusion perpetua, reclusion temporal, prison mayor, prison correctional, arresto mayor, arresto menor. Okay? If the penalty is death or reclusion perpetua, these are indivisible penalties. So do not apply this one. Sabi kanina, if the maximum penalty does not exceed um, one year, arrest of mayor carries the penalty of one year, one day to 30 days. 
Aresto Mayor, one month, one day to six months. Six, prison Correctional, six months, one day to six years. Prison Mayor, six years, one day to 12 years. Reclusion Temporal, 12 years, one day to 20 years. Reclusion, reclusion Perpetua, 20 years, one day to 40 years. Okay? So since this is in the uh, express prohibition, death or reclusion perpetua, so extra to. No? This is not included anymore. Also, the law provides that if the maximum penalty does not exceed one year, so if it's arrest to my, mayor, menor, which is one day to 30 days, not also applicable. If one month and one day to six months, Arresto Bayor is also not applicable. Ergo, Islaw is only applicable if the penalty is in these three. Prison Mayor, Prison Correctional, Prison Mayor, and Reclusion Temporal. These two is uh, included in the first disqualification, and this one is included into the last disqualification. If the penalty is Reclusion Perpetua, and then the law provides, alumbawa, in the example, in the bar exam, there is voluntary surrender. There is plea of guilt. No? These are mitigating circumstances. Will you appreciate this one? No, because it's reclusion perpetua, and reclusion perpetua is a disqualification under Islam. No? Voluntary surrender is an ordinary mitigating. Plea of guilt is an ordinary mitigating. Now, it will be different if there is a privilege mitigating. If, say, for example, 16 years of age acting with discernment, you lower this with one degree. Alam naman natin, if it's a privilege mitigating, the first thing that you do is to go down. So reclusion perpetua, you go down to reclusion temporal. The question is, is reclusion temporal visible or divisible? And it's concluded under Islam. So you will apply this. Divisible. Now you appreciate voluntary surrender and plea of guilt. But if it's, there's no privilege mitigating, if it's just an ordinary mitigating, generic aggravating, no, no appreciation. Kahit damihan mo pa siya ng uh, immediate vindication, passion and obfuscation. No? Uh, no, lack of time to commit so grave or wrong. It has no bearing because it's reclusion perpetua. Okay, two indivisible penalties. Uh, the, if the penalty is reclusion perpetua to death, But these are indivisible penalties, so Islam is not applicable. You only choose which one is the higher, the greater, and the lesser. If there is uh, zero mitigating and one uh, zero mitigating, zero aggravating, you only have to choose which one, the higher, the lesser, death or reclusion perpetua. If zero, zero, it's, it's the lesser penalty, which is reclusion perpetua. If it is one mitigating, zero aggravating, it's the lesser penalty. If zero aggravating and one aggravating, it's the higher penalty. It has its own rules. I'm only showing you that it, they have the own rule and do not apply Islam. No, in these cases, pag nakita mo ng mga indivisible penalties, don't ever compute no, because it will not be appreciated anymore. Next. So this applies to a mitigating circumstance, uh, to, to a divisible penalty, a divisible penalty which has the minimum, medium, and maximum period. <clears throat> okay, let's go. Um, as I've said, 
this is both applicable to SPL and FTC and RPC. SPL muna tayo. How do you get the maximum term? Do not say minimum sentence. Do not say minimum penalty. That is wrong. To get the full credit, you say maximum term and minimum term of the indeterminate sentence. Huh? Maximum term, minimum term of the indeterminate sentence. Again, since this is an SPL, there is no uh, appreciation of mitigating and generic aggravating circumstances. So simply lang yan eh. When this is asked in the bar, no, the bar exam would show two things. No, the penalty provided for by law. Second is the penalty imposed by the court. Ang tanong dyan, is the penalty thus imposed by the court correct or not? Assuming, example, for illegal possession of firearms, a penalty is 5 years to 10 years. So the maximum is, is penalty under the law no, is 10 years and 5 years. Ano bang... What is the law? What is the rule in so far as obtaining the maximum term and minimum term? The law provides that if it's an SPL, the maximum should not increase, should not be greater or should not exceed the maximum penalty or sentence fixed by law. It should not exceed the maximum penalty or sentence fixed by law. In so far as the minimum term is concerned, how do you obtain it? Well, for as long as it does not, it's not lower than the minimum term fixed by law. So anywhere in between would be proper. So the court has the discretion to, impo to, to impose for as long as it should not exceed the maximum uh, penalty or sentence fixed by law, fixed by the SPL, and it should not be lower than the minimum uh, penalty fixed by the special law. So, for example, if there's illegal possession of firearms, the penalty is five years to 10 years. What the court actually imposed, court imposed the penalty of six years to nine years. Is the penalty thus imposed by the court correct, proper, or not? So it's nine, it's six to nine years. Ah, so the question is, is it lower than a five-year minimum? Fixed by law, it's not. It's within, right? What about the maximum? Is, was it does it exceed the maximum penalty fixed by law, which is 10 years? No, it's nine. So it's been in between five to ten. No problem. That's proper. Next, the court imposed a penalty of five years to seven years. Five years. To seven years. Of course, obviously, it does not exceed the 10 year period fixed by law. Now, the question is it lower than the penalty fixed by law, which is five? Five to five? No. Diba? So it's also proper. Check. The penalty imposed by the court is five years to 12 years. Five years to 12. Is it lower than uh, five years? No. So minimum term is proper. What about the maximum term in fact, in, uh, imposed by the court? 10, 12 years where the law fix is only 10 years. 
So 12 as to 10, it exceeded 10 years. So in this case, it's not proper because the maximum uh, term fixed by the court exceeds the 10-year uh, penalty fixed by the special penal law. So madali lang SPL. Anywhere in between is proper. Okay? I hope you get it. Okay, matatakot sa SPL. Asa ah, islaw, madali lang yan. Oh, let's go to the revised penal code. RPC. How do you get the maximum term and the minimum fixed by uh, minimum uh, term and the maximum term? This is the rule. We follow the rule on divisible penalty. Sabi niya, uh, in view of the attending circumstances, meaning to say, uh, you will have to apply the rule of offsetting. Meaning to say, to get the maximum term, you would appreciate the presence of the mitigating and the aggravating circumstances present. Ordinary mitigating and generic aggravating. So this is the only instance where we appreciate the presence of the mitigating and aggravating. So how do you get the minimum term? You get the minimum term by it's one degree lower than that imposed by the RPC, one degree lower than that imposed by the code or the RPC. And don't forget this, the period. The period is only cut and paste. It's uh, the same formula. This is how you will state it. The period of which, the period of which is upon the discretion of the court. This one no, is always constant. If it's the ARP, it's if it's the minimum term, the period in the, the minimum term, you say the period of which is upon the discretion of the court. Sabi sa court, sabi sa ano yan, <clears throat> sa islaw is the range of the penalty. Ito na lang yan eh, mas madali itong i-apply. Okay, let's go to the rule of offsetting. We just apply the rule obtained in the divisible penalty. You have the mitigating and the aggravating circumstances. So, if you have zero mitigate, when I say mitigating, I am referring to generic aggravating. When I talk about aggravating, I'm talking about a, a gene, a generic aggravating as opposed to that of ordinary mitigating. If it's zero, zero, so divisible, you have minimum, right? Medium and maximum period. Mawa. Sample lang, ah. Uh, example. Reclusion, a uh, prison mayor. Prison mayor. Six year, six months, one day to six years. Okay. Six months, one day to six years. You know that. You memorize that. Prison correctional. Okay. You divide it equally into three. 
you will have the minimum term, you will have the medium, as well as the maximum term of the indeterminate sentence. So, precision correction, now we're talking about um, the period. No? Period. When you talk about the rule of offsetting, we're talking about the period. When you talk about privilege mitigating, we're talking about degree. No? Degree. So if there's a uh, mitigating circumstance, zero mitigating and zero aggravating, you will arrive at what? Medium. Let's just erase this one. The medium period, zero, zero, one aggravating, zero mitigating, you will have the minimum. Zero mitigating, one aggravating, you will have the maximum period. For one or more, uh, two or more, I'm sorry. Uh, two or more mitigating circumstances as, as against zero, you will have one degree lower. Remember this one. If there are, and this is only applicable to divisible penalties. Huh? If there are two or more mitigating circumstances and zero aggravating, you will not reduce it by uh, in, in its minimum period, but you reduce it by one degree lower. Now, question, is this a privilege mitigating? No, it's not. Why? Because it can be offset by only, uh, any ordinary mitigating. No? But it, it is only akin to a privilege mitigating in the sense that it will, you will reduce it not in its minimum period, but by a degree. But this is not a privilege mitigating. So if this is applied in a divisive in an indivisible penalty and damning uh, mitigating circumstances, uh, pero ang penalty is reclusion perpetua. Bababa ka ba ng one degree? No, because this is applicable only to a divisible penalty. In an indivisible penalty, as I've mentioned, do not apply any ordinary mitigating and generic aggravating as in this case because this is not a privileged one. Number five. Oh, sir, paano kung there are five mitigating as against one? In the rule of upsetting, sir, do we reduce it by one degree or only in its minimum period? No, you will only reduce it to minimum period. Sir, why? Because there is one. You only reduce it by one degree lower when the aggravating is zero. Next. Now, we, sir, if there is a mitig no mitigating and there are two or more aggravating, does it mean that we will increase it by one degree? No, because this is not favorable to the um, accused. So what you do is only to impose it to its maximum period. Now you apply the rule. S seven, zero, mit uh, two mitigating as against two aggravating, uh, offset it, you will have arrived at the medium period. Next, uh, assuming that there is one mitigating, three aggravating, and you offset this, you will arrive at the maximum period. That's it. Uh, that's it. This is how to obtain uh, the maximum term of the indeterminate sentence. No, you apply the rule of setting, appreciate the mitigating and generic aggravating, and the period, the minimum term would be uh, one one degree lower. No, and the period of which is upon the discretion of the court, sir. Why must we secure 
the maximum term and minimum term of the indeterminate sentence. Ano bang purpose niyan? Because once the convict had served the minimum term of the indeterminate sentence, no? um, he will now be eligible to be released on parole. Mag okay, laya na siya. Only has to report to the parole officer. But why must the court impose the maximum term? Just in case the convict, when talking about the convict, no, kasi ang convict kailangan mag-serve muna ng minimum term in order to be released. But if he violates the condition of his parole, then he will have to serve the maximum term of his indeterminate sentence. Okay? So, let's have an example now. Assuming that the penalty is reclusion temporal and you have voluntary surrender present. Oh, let's go to basic. The penalty for a particular crime is reclusion temporal and what is present is voluntary surrender. The question is determine the maximum term and the minimum term of the indeterminate sentence. Okay, reclusion temporal, you have one, one, one uh, no? uh, voluntary surrender is what kind of circumstance? It is an ordinary mitigating. Is there a uh, ordinary mitigating, one ordinary mitigating? Do you have any aggravating circumstance? Zero. So you will have a case where there is one mitigating and zero aggravating, then you will have to impose the minimum, right? So the penalty, so the, the, the answer is this, no, reclusion temporal in its minimum period as what? As the maximum term of the indeterminate sentence. So that's a way, that's the way to answer it. It's reclusion temporal in its minimum period as the maximum term of the indeterminate sentence. What is the minimum term? What's one degree lower than reclusion temporal? Is it's prison mayor, right? Prison mayor, what is the period? Cut and paste. This is what, what you will uh, write. Prison mayor, the period of which is upon the discretion of the court as what? As the minimum term of the indeterminate sentence. That's how simple Islaw is. Okay. Let's uh, have an example, another example. The penalty is prison mayor. You will have uh, passion and obfuscation. And you have 17 years of age acting with, with discernment, okay? Now, you have determined the maximum term and the minimum term of the indeterminate sentence. Passion and obfuscation. What the first thing that you do is to determine uh, what are the circumstances present. What is its classification? So, seventeen years of age, acting with the servant is a privilege mitigating, and passion and obfuscation is just an ordinary mitigating, and there's no aggravating. So, what must you do? If you see a privilege mitigating, what you do is to appreciate first a privilege mitigating such as this one. Lower it automatically. So you will arrive at pression correctional. No? Pression correctional. And what is 
uh, the period. Now you have one mitigating as against zero aggravating. You will have vision correctional edits since there's one mitigating in in its minimum period as the maximum term of the indeterminate sentence. Now, if there's a privilege mitigating, the point of reckoning is now the privilege mitigating. Here, no, the, the, the penalty that you arrive at. So it's the, the minimum term now is arresto mayor. Okay, that's one degree lower. That's arresto mayor, the period of which is upon the discretion of the court. Okay, that's the second example. Assuming that you have prison, uh, reclusion, temporal, you have uh, uh, aid of uh, aid of armed men. Okay, and what? Uh, you have uh, voluntary surrender. And you have uh, 17 years of age with discernment. Determine the maximum term and the minimum term of the indeterminate sentence. Okay, 17 years of age is <clears throat> which, uh, privilege mitigating. Armen is an one or the uh, aggravating. Voluntary surrender is one uh, ordinary mitigating. Of set one aggravating and one mitigating, you will arrive at uh, idiom period, right? Yeah. So since there's a privilege mitigating, appreciate first the privilege mitigating. So from reclusion temporal, you go down to uh, one degree uh, is prison mayor. And then one as against one, then it's then you will arrive at the medium. So the maximum term is prison mayor in its medium period. Ask the maximum term of the indeterminate sentence. One degree lower is uh, prison correctional and cut and paste, the period of which is upon the discretion of the court. Uh, dali lang siya, right? I hope you get it. Uh, the person is convicted of uh, well, uh, person is uh, the penalty is prison mayor. You have uh, uh, immediate vindication. You have uh, plea of guilt. The determine the maximum and the minimum term. And he is convicted of the crime of rebellion. Ah, you know that these are two mitigating circumstances, but you, do you have to compute? No, you don't have to compute because the penalty is rebellion. And rebellion is what? A disqualification under SLAW. So no more of this. No? Now, the penalty is uh, one month, one day, to six months. Is this correct or not? No, because the penalty is one year or less. If the penalty is one year or less, ang sabi ng batas, impose a straight penalty. Meaning to say, okay, don't even have to state minimum term and maximum. The court can impose six months or seven months and one day don't indicate the maximum or minimum term because the penalty is one year or less 
but say for example you were asked in the bar the penalty is six uh penalty is year, three years and one day for uh uh possession of uh, illicit drugs is the penalty imposed correct or not no because this is an spl and it's more than one year then the court is mandated to get the maximum to to impose a maximum term and the minimum term of the indeterminate sentence okay if the penalty, alumbawa, uh, this were us in the bar. The penalty for murder, I assume, is reclusion temporal. He is uh, convicted of frustrated murder. And you have unlawful aggression, and you have reasonable necessity of the means employed to prevent or repel the same okay determine the maximum term and the minimum term of the indeterminate sentence now, that's the trick in the bar frustrated murder and frustrated murder you know that there's one degree lower yan di ba? one degree lower uh, you know that if it's consummated, frustrated, attempted, uh, frustrated, it's one degree lower than that imposed upon a consummated stage. If it's attempted, frustrated, one degree lower than that of consummated. Attempted is two degrees lower. So, pag sinabing uh, frustrated yan, so, so consummated murder is reclusion temporal, you will impose the uh, one degree lower, which is prison mayor. But you have unlawful aggression and reasonable necessity. This is com incomplete self-defense and the majority are present. So the penalty again is one degree lower, reclusion, uh, prison, correctional, right? Is there any aggravating or mitigating circumstances? No. So what will be the penalty? The penalty is prison correctional in its medium period as the maximum term of the indeterminate sentence. Okay, one degree lower is, uh, minimum is arresto mayor, that's one degree lower. And the period of which is upon the discretion of the court. Okay. So my last question, my last one. Uh, reclus prison mayor, you have 17 years of age with discernment. You have uh, a lawful aggression. You have lack of sufficient provocation. And you have a voluntary surrender. Determine. This is my last for, so far as uh, is law and the minimum term of the indeterminate sentence. Seventeen years of age acting with discernment is what uh, privilege mitigating. A law for aggression, lack of sufficient provocation is privilege mitigating. Voluntary surrender is uh, ordinary mitigating. So what you do now is um, appreciate the presence of the privileged mitigating circumstances. So since it's prison uh, mayor, one degree lower than prison mayor is prison correctional. Then you appreciate another privilege mitigating, this one. You will go down to arresto mayor. You have one ordinary mitigating, so arresto mayor and zero aggravating in its minimum period. So the 
supposedly, the maximum term is arresto mayor in its minimum period. And the minimum term is arresto menor. No? The period of which is upon the discretion of the court. No? But since, since arresto mayor carries the penalty of what? Is it less than six, one, one year? Yes. It's only uh, one month, one day to six months. It's less than one year, uh, less than one year. So you will conclude that Islaw is, is not applicable in this case. But you will have to show your computation. Whenever, no, when you arrive at the, uh, your answer, you show how you arrive at a particular answer. So you show, you explain uh, what are the circumstances that you appreciated, whether it's a privilege, mitigating, or just an ordinary uh, or uh, a generic aggravating circumstances. Okay? Yon. So we finish with Islaw. So we go with the last topic in book one. <clears throat> which is uh, the extinction of criminal liability. Oh, wala, extinction. No. I missed the ex extinction of criminal liability. Well, anyway, uh, the law provides that uh, Service, service of sentence is a total extinction of criminal liability. What is the effect of death? Death before or after final conviction. No problem with that. So there's no criminal liability. No? In so far as pecuniary liability. No? Uh, pecuniary, there's no, pecuniary liability is extinguished if there is no final conviction. No? It is not if death occurs, if death occurs before final conviction, if death occurs after final conviction, conviction, then uh, pecuniary liability is not extinguished. So, Bawa, uh, he was convicted of murder. No. And he appealed this case to the Court of Appeals. No? Uh, pending, pending, the pending review by DCA, it's not yet final. No? Because there's still an appeal. If he dies while the CA or the Court of Appeals is reviewing the case, then his pecuniary liability is extinguished. But say, for example, the CA already affirmed the decision of the RTC and there was no appeal to the Supreme Court and there was already an entry of judgment no? and the records are now remanded to the MTC, uh, to the RTC, to the uh, court ago uh, and uh, there's already an, uh, an entry of the judgment. Is it final? or not, it's already final because there's already an entry of judgment. And after the entry of judgment, no, the, the, the appellant died. Okay, will it extinguish his uh, pecuniary liability, civil liability? No, because he died no, after final conviction. Now, uh, yung, it will extinguish his pecuniary liabilities where he dies before final conviction or final judgment no? is only applicable to crimes arising from to civil liability, pecuniary liabilities arising from delict. Now, if, if the civil liability arises from a contract, an obligation, and 
this is not applicable. That's another uh, also another uh, situation. No? Hindi siya applicable. So magiging liable siya. Because it arises not from delic but from other obligation. So what is being referred to is an obligation arising only from a crime. Okay. We finish with book one. Uh, I, I, do, I hope that we can finish with the uh, others. Okay. <clears throat> Let's go to book two. Uh, book two, let's go to uh, uh, falsification, forgery. When you talk about forgery under 169, it only refers to treasury banknotes or instruments payable to bearer, the appearance of a true and genuine document. ESCA, the second is Erasing, substituting, counterfeiting, or altering letters, figures, or words contained therein. So how do you differentiate forgery from falsification? False forgery under 169 is limited to TBI, treasury, banknotes, instruments to be payable to bearer or to order. Now, um, kinds of, uh, of documents, public document, notarized yan, official document issued yan ng government or its agents no private document uh, deed executed ng private individual without intervention ng uh, notary public commercial document in ex executed in accordance with the code of commerce no or our mercantile law there are several cases in so far as falsification counter counterfeiting imitating any handwriting or signature no or uh, causing it to appear that the person have participated in any act or proceeding where in fact they did not so participate. It is not necessary that the imitation be perfect. It is enough that there should be an attempt to imitate of two signatures, the genuine and the forge. They bear resemblance to each other. Uh, making untruthful statement in a narration of facts. Elements, merong obligation on the part of the accused to disclose the truth. And second, wrongful intent to injure a third person. The untruthful narration must also be such as to affect the integrity of the document or change uh, its effects. No? <clears throat> uh, change the effects which it would otherwise produce. Uh, when you talk about legal uh, obligation, it means that there is a law requiring the disclosure of the facts contained in a document. It is, if in the deed of sale of a parcel of land, the accused made it appear that the property is from, free from all encumbrances, where in truth, and in fact, he did not own the land, the crime committed is a staffer to falsification of a public document. Pag sinabing altering of true dates, dapat yung uh, uh, the true date is essential. It has no application. The rule has no application when the act is committed not by ignorance or mistake, but rather to prevent the discovery of an illegal appropriation of public funds. Now, making alteration or intercalation in a genuine document so there is a genuine document. There is an alteration or intercalation. Something is inserted therein, which changes the meaning of the document. And the change made the document speak something which is false. So an alteration which makes a document speaks the truth does not contain falsification. Dapat, it will speak something false. Kung nagkaroon ng alteration or intercalation and which makes the document speaks the truth, it does not constitute falsification. Falsification, how do you differentiate falsification of a private document from a public document? Ang falsification, pareho silang merong falsification. What is falsified is a public document. The other one is uh, falsified is a private document. Pero in addition sa private document, uh, there is 
damage or intent to cause damage. In falsification of a public document, you know, damage is not an element. So once the na falsify mo ang public document, the crime is consummated. So private once the falsify falsify mo ang private document, it does not uh, mean that. Uh, there is already a consummated crime of falsification of a private document. Bakit? Kinakailangan, you still have to prove the element of damage. Damage is an element or intent to cause damage. So the falsification is uh, committed in ways specified under 171. No? <clears throat> so this is the difference between the two. So there's also the use of falsified document. No, hindi siya nag-falsified, but the offender knew that the document was falsified by another. The false second, the false document uh, is embraced under 171, no? And he introduced such document in evidence in any judicial proceeding. Pag sinabing false testimony against the defendant, false testimony, uh, criminal proceeding. May criminal proceeding yan. So, offender testifies under oath against the defendant who gives the false testimony. Uh, offender who gives false testimony knows na dapat alam niya it is false. <clears throat> the uh, defendant against whom the false testimony is given is either acquitted or convicted in a final judgment. No. So there's also a crime of false testimony in civil cases. Perjury. Perjury. This is a favorite by question. No. Uh, how is this committed? <clears throat> this is committed by falsely testifying under oath or making false affidavit. Falsely testifying under oath. So pwede siyang ilagay sa stand, so witness stand, but not in a judicial proceeding. Basta non-judicial proceeding, uh, perjury yun. Or making a false statement. No? Now, requisites na uh, make a statement, okay? Apos, uh, it, the statement or affidavit was made before a competent court or a competent officer authorized the man to receive and administer the same. Uh, thirdly, it, there must be a deliberate and willful assertion of falsehood. Okay? And it is authorized by law. And tapos, ang pinakimportante sa perjury is that it should be on a material matter. Pagka hindi siya on a material matter, wala nang tayong pag-uusapang perjury. It means that the main fact which is the subject of inquiry or any fact or circumstance which tend to corroborate or strengthen the testimony. Okay? Uh, so, kung if admitted ba yan, it would probably alter the result of the trial. If yes, then there's perjury. No? Pag sinabing when the law so requires, it does not mean that the sworn statement or affidavit must be required by law. It is only permissive, not mandatory. So in cases in which the law authorizes, yun ang ibig sabihin niya. So it's a bar question, it's a bar problem. Sinabi, isang government employee, i-charge siya ng ano, immorality, uh, having a uh, marriage siya, no? having affair with another co-employee. No? Uh, naniniwala, the, the girl... Uh, knows that she's uh, he is single but in truth and in fact he is married no now he was required to submit a an affidavit a counter affidavit why he and was made to explain why he should not be uh, terminated no now he's, he's, he mentioned he stated in his affidavit that i black black lang single uh, uh, and under oath, okay, say the following: I vehemently deny all the material allegations, blah and blah. But he was he's 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 married. But what he stated is that he's single, and because of that, he was charged with perjury. Is he guilty of perjury? He's not guilty of perjury, 
because even if there's a willful uh, falsehood asserted by him, it's not on a material matter. No, Whether A is single or married, the charge of immorality against him could prosper or uh, proceed. No, So a civil status is not a defense to the charge of immoral immorality. No, uh, so it will not. It's not. It will not alter the the outcome of the case. So it's not on a material matter. So no perjury. Pero kung siya ay nag uh, petition siya for naturalization, he's a foreigner. No, and he has a petition for naturalization, and he was convicted of a crime. No, uh, uh, of BP 22, which is a crime uh, involving moral turpitude. And he failed to disclose that in his petition. No, did he commit the crime of perjury? Yes, because it is on a material matter. Because if he's convicted, of be, and it, it came to the knowledge of the court, then his petition will be denied. But if he's not charged, then the petition may be granted. Huh? <clears throat> so there's also an offering of false testimony. The, 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 the offender in evidence, uh, offender offered in evidence a false witness. He knew that that witness is false, that the offers was made in a judicial or official proceeding. So crimes against uh, persons, no, let's discuss. So you have parricide, You have infanticide. You have abortion. <clears throat> Excuse me. Intentional or unintentional. And you have murder. And you have homicide. Parricide. The killing of the father, mother, or child, whether the, whether the relationship is legit or illegitimate. Other than other ascendants would be, the relationship must be legit. Other descendants' relationship must be legitimate. So, uh, yung grandfather must be a legitimate one. Grandchildren should be legitimate. But if it is father, mother, child, then relationship can be legitimate or illegitimate. So, there's no parasite of a brother or sister because it refers only to a direct line, di ba? Direct line lang siya, whether ascendants, uh, descending or ascending. The only one which is that of that relation is the spouse. The spouse which must be legitimate. Okay. Now let's, let, let's go to infanticide, the killing of a child who is less than three days old. So regardless of there's a relationship or not, basta ang uh, edad niya is uh, less than three days old, so infanticide. Abortion can be intentional or unintentional. Uh, there's intent to abort. So so and of course force is also a uh, an element of this crime so if the husband uh, they had an altercation with the wife the wife fell down and died instantly but she's six months pregnant and 
the child no live for 20 hours what crime did h commit wife died so no problem so there's parricide it could be a complex crime resulting to what parricide okay the child lived for six months for uh for 20 hours reckon from the time that he was separated from the mother's womb so is that uh, infanticide or abortion? The law pro provides that if a child had an intrauterine life, intrauterine life of uh, less than seven, less than seven months, he should live for twenty four hours from the from the time that he was separated from the mother's womb. So since here he lived only for twenty hours, and kasi six months lang siya, so therefore the crime is. Uh, a complex crime of parricide with unintentional abortion. If the child lived for eight months, no need to determine whether he lived uh, for 24 hours or not because eight months naman siya. Uh, Na-satisfy niya yun na yung seven months. Eh, no? Let's go to murder and homicide. Killing, which is not infanticide or parricide. In both instances, there's intent to kill. But here we have the presence of Qualifying aggravating circumstances enumerated under Article 248. Ang sa baryad is uh, evident premeditation and uh, treachery. As I mentioned, bapat pag treachery yan, he had opportunity to defend himself, no opportunity to defend himself, and that it was consciously and deliberately adopted. So it's qualifying in the crime of murder. Evident premeditation is the time that he actually uh, decided to commit the crime. That there's acts manifestly showing that he clung to his determination uh, to commit the crime. And lapse of time from the time he executed to the, uh, to the time that he determined the crime to the time that he actually executed the crime. Yon. No? Uh, it's under Article 14, but what is not included in Article 14 is outraging or scoffing at the corpse. It is, it, this is a qualifying aggravating in the crime of murder. Anong significance? Si A, uh, they had an altercation, no? Uh, and we had an opportunity to defend him to defend himself. They had a fist fight, but uh, unfortunately, no, na bugbug the ACB, B died. But there was no treachery. No, he was able to defend himself, but he was overpowered by A. Now, after killing B, what did A did is to behead B and threw his head in the river. What crime did A commit? The crime A committed is outraging or scoffing at the corpse. It is immaterial already whether B was able to defend himself or not. Now remove all this qualifying aggravating, the crime is homicide. No, if there's treachery, it's murder. If no treachery, for as long as there is intent to kill, then there is homicide. Okay. Uh... I think we need to extend for a few minutes long. That under exceptional circumstances, you know that this already, that is a legally buried person uh, that uh, that he surprised his spouse in the act of committing intercourse, that he killed this person uh, either uh, 
due in the act of committing uh, the sexual intercourse or immediately thereafter. So, yun. What else? We also... Uh, death in a, in a tumultuous affray if a person dies and uh, the one who inflicted uh, the one the one who was ki- uh, somebody was killed no and the person who killed this person cannot be actually be identified no but the one who inflicted serious physical injuries or use violence can be identified so uh, yun ang elements but the groups no there should be several persons and this do not compose of groups organized for the common purpose of assaulting or attacking each other. So, hindi pwede yung silang alam ba, fraternity, naghamunan silang mag-away, mag-grumble, no. no? This, this group should not be for the purpose of assaulting and attacking uh, each other. <clears throat> so, I think um, let's go to crime against uh, property. Let's go to crime against property. Robbery. Theft. And uh, estafa. Robbery, there is uh, intent to gain. There is unlawful taking of personal property that uh, belongs to another. And that uh, there's violence, intimidation against a person, and there is force upon things. Yeah. Intent to gain. Pareho rin sila ng element ng theft. Unlawful taking. Meron din. Personal property. Uh, meron din. It belongs to another, yes. Except that there's no violence or intimidation against persons or force upon things. No? And there's robbery. Robbery, theft. We also have uh, other ways to commit theft. No? Finder's keeper is also theft. The only difference between theft and estafa, though, when you have physical possession, you have theft. Qualified theft, usually. You know? Estafa, there is a juridical possession. You can even set it up against the owner himself. No? Halimbawa, nagpagawa ka ng sasakyan sa repair shop, ang kontrata nyo is five days. So, yung five days na yun, yung repair shop has juridical possession over the same. Pero kung may driver ka, um, in driver mo, binigay mo lang ang, ang susi, no? uh, and he's doing his job, that's all you need, physical possession. And that's, that's that uh, estafa. Okay, let's go to our special complex crime. Robbery, <coughs> excuse me, with homicide. It's a special complex crime. Homicide in this case is used in a generic sense. So this is a special complex crime where two crimes are committed but punished under a single provision of the RPC. <coughs> Sabi ng ano ng batas is uh, if by reason or on occasion of robbery, somebody dies, then the crime is robbery with rape, a uh, robbery with homicide, even if the killing is not uh, intentional. So generic, this is intentional or unintentional. Okay. Um, there is, is there a crime of robbery with murder? Wala, because 
no? Uh, it's already included in the crime of robbery with homicide. So what does it mean? It, this is applicable actually if at the onset there is intent to gain or intent to rob. And somebody dies before, during, or immediately after the robbery. No? Yun. So somebody dies. Even if the killing is not part of the plan. Say, for example, uh, A and B and C decided to rob X in his house. So they have a plan. Ikaw, si A and B were to go inside uh, and amass all pers personal properties. Si C, Nakita sa X, he was sleeping. And he doesn't want to be identified by C. Killed X. And they were able to escape, all of them. They were charged with robbery with homicide. Are they liable for robbery with homicide? A and B as well. Sabi ni A, I'm not liable for robbery with homicide because I'm only liable for the crime that I co we conspired to commit, which is uh, only robbery. C alone should be liable in this case. Is the contention of A tenable or not? The answer is no, because this is a special complex crime of robbery with homicide. If by reason or an occasion of robbery somebody dies, then all of them will be liable for robbery with homicide, even if the killing is not part of the plan. Okay. Say, for example, C was not intentionally killed, but he fell down from the stairs and C died while A, B, C, and are in the act of escaping. Would, be they, would they be liable for the death of C? Yes, because again, he died by reason or education or robbery, even if he died immediately after the robbery and he died unintentionally it's still robbery with homicide okay what if a was in the second floor a co-conspirator and a was the one who fell from the stairs and died the b and c were charged with robbery with homicide sabi ni nilang dalawa hindi kami liable because no they are our ano, companions and principal is the contention proper, correct or not? No, because again, if by reason of, or occasion of robbery somebody dies, then they will all be liable. Even if the person who died is their co-conspirator. Yeah? So, ganun yun. Uh, what if they plan, what they plan is actually only to commit the crime of Murder and robbery is an off afterthought. A, B, and C conspired to kill X. So they went inside the house and killed X. Thereafter, C saw the jewelry box of X and forcibly opened the same. Okay, are they liable for robbery with homicide? No, because at the onset, a requirement ng batas, there should be intent to gain. At the onset, what was their intent? Intent is to kill. And in this case, what will be the, the crimes committed? A, B, and C will be liable for the crime that they conspired to commit, which is murder. C, in addition, will be liable for robbery. No? But C alone should be liable for that because no, wala namang kinalaman si A and B unless they become an accessory in this case. Now, robbery with rape. Ganun din. If by reason on occasion of robbery somebody was raped, then all of them will be liable for composite crime of robbery with rape even if rape is not a plan. What will be the proper defense of A and B? So, 
if they endeavor to prevent C from raping X. Sir, paano kung namatay at na-rape? They will be liable for robbery with homicide. Rape will be considered as what? As an aggravating circumstance. Okay? Next. Robbery with force upon things. If the breaking of the the roof, no, the wall, the floor, the windows, and the door. Why must the offender break the wall, roof, door, floor? The purpose is to effect entrance. That's robbery with force upon things. Okay, using false keys. Okay, to affect entrance, o kaya is simulation of authority to affect entrance. O kaya, without breaking, without these circumstances, open lang ang door, pumasok siya, without all these three instances. But the offender took or inside, no? Okay. Had forcibly open or have broken any clothes receptacle or furniture, they will be liable for robbery. Okay, they took this clothes receptacle or furniture to be broken outside. Then they will be liable also for robbery with force upon things. Qualified theft if committed by uh, a domestic servant or abuse of uh, there is of course uh, importante dito yung motor vehicle no motor vehicle okay. How do you differentiate that from carnapping? Pang pagkakarnapping, uh, it is taking the motor vehicle without the consent of the owner, or using force or intimidation. Motor motor vehicle is that there, he has physical possession over the same. Ibinigay sa kanya yung susi, kasi driver siya, eh, kaya lang di niya binalik, di ba? Or coconut taken from plantation. Or fish, they can fish pan to protect their industry. Kaya yun ang ginawang krimen ng batas. Or on the occasion of a calamity, calamity or vehicular accident, lubabas sa barto, no? Vehicular accident, liable sila for qualified theft, no? Finder's keeper is also a theft, ano? Crime of theft. Let's go to Estafa. Estafa is through uh, abuse of confidence or through deceit. But they have a common element. What is the common element? The common element is that there will should be damage or intent to cause damage. Uh, common na lumalabas sa bar is through a misappropriation. Appropriation of funds. So, he holds the property by commission, trust, or administration. Not in the concept of the owner. Pag-owner yan, walang estafa. Bawa, ito yung Uh, Avon Products, no? siya ay agent. Obligation of the agent is to sell it to the public. Once he sold this to the public, then his obligation is to remit. And that's the time that he will give, uh, receive, he will receive his commission. If he, or if he's unable to sell it, 
na bring and uh, uh, return the prop the, the the items if he failed to remit the same then he will be liable for uh staffa through misappropriation but if he bought these properties wala siyang obligation bawa Si A, bumili, ng, bumili siya ng TV, installment, 10 installments, equal installment from SM, worth 50,000 pesos. Okay? On the first month, nakabayad siya. On the second month, hindi na siya nagbayad. Binenta niya sa si C, sa cousin niya, worth, tumubo pa siya, eh. tumubo, 55,000. And he failed to pay SM. Question, will he be liable for uh, estafa? No, because he bought the item on installment. He's uh, in possession thereof, you know, in the concept of an owner. If at all, the reliability of A is only civil in nature. Okay? Estafa through a uh, post-dated check. Staffa through post-dated check. Um, differentiate this from BP22. Here, there is damage. BP22 through issuance of a post-dated check. BP22, there's damage or intent to cause damage. BP22, none. No? Uh, there is, here, there is uh, payment of simultaneous obligation. Simultaneous with the parting of the goods is the employment of deceit. So, sabi, eto may check ako. No, may check ako. Uh, big, give me your goods because the, I assure you this check is funded. So, there's an employment of deceit. Were it not for the deceit, the other party would not have given me the goods. So, BP22 wala. Pre existing obligation nito. Meaning to say, uh, that has been our commercial transaction in the past. Give me your goods, I'll pay you in check. Give me your goods, I'll pay you in check. Pero at one point, uh, the tubalbog ang check. Eh. What else? Um, they have a... Dito sa post-dated check, uh, sa estafa, is given only three days. To make good the check. Otherwise, it will give a presumption of deceit. Sa BP22, wala. Uh, five days siya. Five banking days. Otherwise, it will give a presumption of knowledge of insufficiency of funds. Sa, sa estafa, uh, knowledge ng presumption of deceit. A person can be both liable for estafa as well as uh, issuance of a post-dated check as well as for BP-22. Of course, estafa is under RPC. BP-22 is as SPL. Estafa, good faith is a proper defense. BP-22, good faith is not a proper defense, right? What is punished in BP-22 is what? Uh, issuance of a worthless check. Sa BP, sa estafa, there's an element of bad faith or deceit. Okay? Yun. Duro. I can... Will, uh, will it be possible if we extend for some time just to say, just, just to, I uh, know, uh, I can also include Special penal laws. Okay lang ba? Let me go into... the, the best uh, SPL. Okay, let's go to special penal laws. I hope everyone can see this one. Mm. 
uh, violence against women and children. So this is, uh, sabi, es, ano, abuse, uh, Safe Spaces Act, Child Abuse, and Data Privacy. Those are the topics included in the bar exam. Okay. Define violence against women and children. <clears throat> it refers to any act or series of acts committed by any person against a woman, not against any woman, but the woman must be his former wife or his wife or against a woman with whom a person has a sexual or dating relationship. O kaya, with whom he has a common child, whether or against the child himself or herself, no? and whether legitimate or illegitimate, within or without a family uh, abode, which result or likely to result into uh, physical, sexual, uh, psychological harm or suffering or economic abuse. No? including threats of acts, battery, assault, coercion, harassment, or arbitrary deprivation of liberty. So we have, uh, thank you, ngayon ko lang nabasa sa inyo, yes, our pleasure. So we will extend that uh, for a few minutes. Uh, when you talk about violence, you have physical, sexual, psychological, and economic uh, abuses. So this is based, this question is based on a recent decision. No? Are acts of violence against women and children deemed as transitory or continuing crimes? <clears throat> what may give, Supreme Court said that what may be gleaned from uh, RA 90, section 7 of RA 9262 is that the law contemplates that acts of violence against women and children may ma manifest as transitory or continuing crimes, meaning that some acts material or essential thereto and requisite in their consummation occur in one place or territory, while some occur in another. <clears throat> Sabi ng court, uh, um, pagka gano'n na nangyari, you can file it in any place. A person charged with a continuing or transitory crime may be validly tried in any municipality or territory where the offense was in part committed. Ang, ang TPO, Temporary Protection Order, cannot be issued in favor of a man against his wife. Bakit wala pa tayong violence against women, against men and their children? So pinagalitan ng court itong judge na nag-issue nito. What is the concept of a battered women syndrome? It refers to a scientifically defined pattern of psychological and behavioral symptoms found in women uh, but in, in living in a battering relationship as a result of cumulative abuse. So I think you, uh, you should memorize this. Don't take the bar without memorizing section 26. No, lagyan nyo ng star yan. Is a battered women syndrome a proper def defense? V this has been asked several times. So victim survivors who are found by the courts to be suffering from a battered women syndrome do not incur any criminal or civil liability, notwithstanding the absence of any of the elements of justifying circumstances of self-defense. Meaning to say, kahit walang unlawful aggression, kahit reasonable necessity, kahit wala nun, kung, pin, kung halimbawa pinatay niya asawa niya, natutulog, no? uh, it can be, uh, uh, it will be a proper defense. She will, she will not incur any criminal or civil liability for as long as she can prove that she's suffering from a battered women syndrome. 
the case of people versus Enosa, remember this. There are three phases and two cycles. Tension building, acute battering, and also tranquil loving period. No? Uh, say for example, um, ito, tension building, acute battering, and you have tranquil loving phase. Hindi, in, pag lumabas sa bar, pagka ginulpe, kaagad ang wife niya, it doesn't necessarily mean that she's suffering from a battered women syndrome because you have to, to prove, you have to look at whether it underwent these three phases. And it should be in two cycles. Kung dito lang tumigil yan at hindi na pinakita sa bar, no? so wala yun. It's not. She's not suffering from battered women syndrome. Or if it fails to to say to state that it underwent two cycles. When you say tension building, this is the where the minor battering occurs. Acute battering is characterized by destructiveness, you no know, brutality, or even uh, death. Tranquil loving is where the man would say would ask forgiveness from his wife. And the wife will forgive him. Uh, knowing that she's the sole anchor of the man's emotional stability, siya lang ang nakakaindide sa kanyang uh, husband. No? She can justify that. Okay? If that happens in two cycles with these three phases, then she's suffering from a battered women's syndrome. Next. So as I mentioned, tension building, this is where the mining binar battering occurs. Verbal, slight physical abuse, or other hostile form of uh, behavior. <clears throat> Acute battering, brutality, destructiveness, and death. And as I've said, tranquil loving period is where the couple experience a profound relief. No? Uh, on the other hand, the battered woman also tries to convince herself that the battery will never happen again, that her partner will change for the better, and that this good, gentle, and caring man, parang Robin Padilla, is the real person whom she loves. Abuses may be committed uh, by another through conspiracy. So, uh, yung, yung parents in law can be uh, also. Uh, we filed with this case uh, with an allegation of conspiracy. So you know that conspiracy is uh, an idea coming from the revised penal code, but it's applicable here, uh, though this is a special penal law. Does RA-9262 criminalize marital infidelity per se? No, what RA-9262 criminalizes is not the material infidelity per se, but psychological violence causing mental or emotional suffering on the wife. So otherwise stated, said the court, it is the violence inflicted under the said circumstances that the said law seeks to outlaw. Mental or emotional suffering of the victim is an essential and distinct element in the commission of the crime. Coercive control, is it also a form of psychological abuse under RA 9262? Said the court, uh, yes, no, uh, it is. No? Coercive control refers to a pattern of behavior meant to dominate a partner. To different tactics, katulad ng physical, sexual violence, threat, emotional insults, and economic deprivation. Although not specifically named, said the court, coercive control as a form of psychological abuse or harm has been recognized in RA 9262. Baka lumabas sa bar ito. Uh, that's the case of Tani de la Fente versus de la Fente. And it was penned by Justice Lonin himself. 
decided on March 8, 2017. So take note of this. Okay. Is the crime of violence against women and children a public offense or a private one? Okay, it is a public offense. No, it's not a private. It's a private. Alam natin, those who can file are only those enumerated under the law. But any here, any private, any citizen, for as long as he has the personal knowledge of the circumstances involving the crime, then uh, the person may file. Okay, uh, any person under the influence of alcohol, illicit drug, mind altering substance shall not be a defense under this act. Well, uh, there are protection orders though, for the purpose of pre preventing further acts, and they are as follows TPO, protection, uh, temporary protection order, BPO, barangay protection order, and PPO. Permanent Protection Order. Child Abuse Law. Let's go to the Child Abuse Law. The child defined child abuse. Okay, uh, refers to maltreat. Pag 3B, ito yon. Maltreatment, whether habitual or not. No, the child in, it includes psychological, physical abuse or neglect, cruelty, sexual abuse emotional maltreatment or any deeds or words which the basis the grades the means the intrinsic worth and dignity of a child as a human being okay or unreasonable deprivation of his basic needs for survival failure to give medical treatment no so it can be done only through once pederion it is inconsequential inconse that sexual abuse occurred only once. So it includes uh, physical abuse, whether the same is habitual or not. So elements of 5A, lahat dito relates to prostit child prostitution. Uh, accused engages and promotes, facilitates, induces child prostitution. Lahat niyan, uh, taking advantage of relationship to procure child as a child prostitute. Basta it refers basically to child prostitution. Now, 5B does not refer to child prostitution. Okay, and What are the elements under 5B? No, accused commits an act of sexual intercourse or lascivious conduct. Second, the act is performed with a child exploited in prostitution or subject to other sexual abuse. Then the child is below 18 years of age. <clears throat> the law uses the term a child subject to sexual abuse. When, a, when is a child deemed subjected to other sexual abuse aside from child prostitution? Uh, if when the child in, indulges, number one, in lascivious conduct under coercion or influence of any adult. No? Under coercion or influence of any adult. Okay? In lascivious conduct under coercion or influence, there must be some uh, form of compulsion equivalent to intimidation, which subdues the free exercise of the offended party's free will. So again, each uh, incident uh, of sexual intercourse and lascivious conduct with a child is a separate and distinct uh, offense. So, yun. Halimbawa, 22 years old yung lalaki, 17 years old yung babae. Hindi, hindi malayo yung edad nila, no? Um... Uh, Wala namang child prostitution, but this charge of, of sexual abuse. And the man, sabi niya, it's consensual. It's consensual. Um, so if, if that is the case, what must be proved? What must be proven by the prosecution? Kailangan yung element ng persuasion, inducement, enticement or coercion must be present 
Kung walang, if there's no persuasion or inducement, enticement or coercion exerted against the minor child, then uh, no liability under this one, under Section 5B. Can a person be charged of committing an act punished under Section 5B and rape at the same time? Uh, if the victim of sexual abuse is below 12 years of age, okay, file mo siya ng statutory rape under Article 266, A1 and D of the RPC. On the other hand, if the victim is 12 years or older, the offender should be charged with either isa lang doon, sexual abuse under Section 5B or rape. However, the offender cannot be accused of both crimes for the same. Hindi pa pwedeng pareho. Isa lang pipiliin. Otherwise, double jeopardy will lie. Can rape instead be complex with violation of Section 5B? Rape complex with uh, child abuse under Section 5B. You can easily answer this one because an RPC cannot be complex with uh, a special penal law, right? That's a basic rule. Can an accused be convicted of acts of lasciviousness under RPC instead of violation of Section 5B of RA 7610? Yes, the sir, sabi ng court, the special circumstance that the child subjected to other sexual abuse is not an element in the crime of acts of lasciviousness which is published under the revised penal code. Yung bang rules of upsetting, mitigating, aggravating, applicable in 17610, it being a special law. I mentioned this a while ago. No? Since it's an R SPL and yet it adopted the nomenclature of the RPC, the rules of upsetting applicable to 7610. Okay, we're now dealing <clears throat> um, the end Safe Spaces Act. There's no actually ano pa, uh, jurisprudence on the matter. We'll just highlight uh, little topics which may be asked in the bar. Coverage uh, of the Safe Spaces Act. Gender-based sexual harassment. Uh, committed in the following street and public places. Second, online. Third, workplace. Fourth, educational and training institutions. So when you talk about public spaces, yun yun, streets, alleys, public parks, uh, government offices, public utility vehicles, okay? And uh, yung app-based transport network, kasama din nun. Gender refers to a set of socially ascribed uh, characteristics and uh, norms, ro roles, attitudes, values, expectations, identifying the social behavior of men and women and the relations between them. Pag sinabing gender identity and or expressions, ano yung sabihin? It refers to personal sense of identity as Characterize among others, yung kanyang manner of clothing, inclination, behavior in relation to a masculine and feminine conventions. No? So a person may have a male or female identity with physiological characteristics of the opposite sex, in which case this uh, person is considered as transgender. Okay. So these are the gender-based streets and public spaces sexual harassment. Ayun. Siguro medyo tatandaan nyo lang to, committed lang sa public space. Mga acts na to, cut calling, wolf whistling, unwanted invitations, uh, pers uh, persistent invited comments, relentless requests for sexual details, statement of sexual comments and suggestions, no? and other advances. So, Cut calling refers to unwanted remarks directed towards a person. Okay. Misogenic, anistic remarks or slurs are 
any statements in whatever form or however delivered that are indicative of the feeling of hating women or the belief that men are inherently better than women. Sexist remarks or slurs or statements in whatever form or however delivered that are uh, indicative of prejudice or next stereotype or discrimination on the basis of sex, typically against women. Transphobic remarks or slurs or statements in whatever form or however delivered, indicative of fear, hatred, or aversion towards persons whose gender identity or expressions do not conform with their sex assigned at birth death. Yan. Pag gender-based sexual harassment in public utility vehicles where the perpetrator is the driver shall also constitute a breach of contract of carriage. Okay. Ito na ang ano, section 11, uh, punishable acts. Uh, uh, cursing, wolf whistling, cut calling, lahat na. No? Basta statement which invaded uh, person's personal space or threatens the person's sense of personal liberty. Okay. Offensive body gestures, nonverbal, no? or you're in, uh, exposing private parts. No? Three, stalking. No? Tapos acts na merong accompanied by touching, pinching, brushing against the body of the offended person. Uh, any touching of uh, uh, any parts, including inner tights, face, buttocks, or any part of the victim's body. No? Even, nakalagay doon, even when not accompanied with acts mentioned in one and two. Kaya ingat-ingat na lang din. Okay? Gender-based, meron ding online. Meron ding online sexual harassment. So, yan. Physical, psychological, emotional threats, unwanted sexual uh, misogynistic, transphobic, lahat ng uh, phobic remarks. Yeah. If you invade the victim's privacy through cyber stalking and incessant messaging or uploading and sharing without the consent of the victim any form of media that contains their photos, their videos, sexual content. Yeah. Or unauthorized records or sharing of the victim's photos, videos, or other information online. Impersonating identities of victims online. Yon. Well, filing false abuse reports to online platforms. Hmm. At ito ay imprescriptible. Offenses constituting gender-based online sexual harassment shall be imprescriptible. Yeah. So these are the uh, offended parties sa binorm. Uh, merong special mention dyan. O kaya kung uniform PNP ka. No? or any conduct of sexual nature and other conduct based on sex affecting the dignity of a person. Unwelcome, unreasonable, and offensive to the recipient. Whether done verbally, physically, or through uh, text messaging, ele electronic mail. No? Yun. A conduct that is unwelcome. Kung unwelcome ka, wag mo nang gawin. And pervasive. and creates an intimidating, hostile, or humili humiliating environment for the recipient no? this also happening uh, applicable between peers superior so officer teacher training to a trainer by a training gender there's also gender based sexual harassment in educational and training institutions ganun din yon for uh, only that the venue is uh, in uh, the schools Minor students are found to have committed acts of violence held liable administratively. Yan. Data Privacy Act, 
uh, process of personal, uh, <clears throat> sorry, this is the last one. Information shall adhere to go, so only take 10 minutes to uh, principles of transparency, legitimate purpose, and proportionality. So let, let's go na lang sa ano. Uh, It has a territorial application. No, no. The, practice, the act, practice, or processing relates to personal information about Philippine citizens. No? Eh, <clears throat> Data subject refers to an individual whose personal information is processed. No? Um, so, kailangan, kailangan magkaroon ng consent. Otherwise, liable siya pag information, personal information is uh, given outside. Sensitive personal information refers to personal information. Uh, yung kanyang mga health, education, sexual life of a person, issued by a government agency, peculiar to individual, no? lahat yan, no? they are protected. Privileged information also. No? Modes of uh, committing the same in processing, yon, unauthorized processing, processing for unauthorized uh, purposes, pagka accessing, ito yung ano, modes of committing, no, and accessing due to negligence, unauthorized access or intentional breach, pag disclosure, unauthorized disclosure or malicious uh, uh, disclosure, other modes, improper, improper disposal, concealment of security breach, no? or combination or series of acts. Next, punishable acts. Baka may lamabasa bar dito, just hang on. Eh. An authorized process of processing of personal information and sensitive personal information no? committed uh, by persons who process uh, personal information without the consent of the data subject no? or without being authorized under the Data Privacy Act. Next. Processing of personal information and sensitive personal information for unauthorized purposes committed by persons who, who process personal information for purposes not authorized by the su data subject or authorized by the Data Privacy Act. Okay. Processing refers to uh, any uh, set of operations, katulad ng Collection, recording, organization, storage, updating, modification, retrieval, consultation, use, consolidation, blocking, erasures, or destruction of data. So, yan. Pag unauthorized processing, no, at processing for unauthorized purposes, no, violation yan. No? Persons involved processing in personal info or sensitive personal info. No? Committed on the left side by any person, on the right side, committed by an authorized person. No? The process is done for purposes not authorized by the data. Dun sa right side, process for unauthorized purposes. In the, dun sa left, unauthorized processing, the processing is done without the consent of the data subject or the person has no authority under the law. No? 
Pero din uh, committed by person who due to negligence provided access to personal information without being authorized under the data privacy or any existing law. Next. Unauthorized access or intentional breach committed by persons who knowingly and unlawfully are violating data confidentiality and security data systems break in any way into any uh, system where personal and sensitive personal information is stored. Okay. Accessing due to negligence and yeah, and unauthorized access or intentional breach on the left side, on the right side. Pag uh, accessing due to negligence, uh, committed by providing access to personal information or sensitive personal information. He has no authority to provide access and there is negligence. On the right side, sa unauthorized access naman, committed naman siya by breaking into a system and such system uh, stores personal and sensitive personal information. The act naman is intentional. Okay? And there is also malicious disclosure, okay? And unauthorized disclosure, okay? Yon. So merong malicious at unauthorized disclosure. Yung sa left side, malicious with malice or bad faith. The other one, without consent or data subject, okay? And there's also improper disposal of personal information and sensitive personal information. Okay, and concealment of security breaches involving uh, sensitive personal information. After having knowledge of a security breach and fail to notice, notify the National Privacy Commission. So, yun na yun. Okay, I think uh, we have gone through a lot. Uh, I hope... Uh, and pray that you will do well in criminal law. And I hope that you learn something uh, out of my lecture. But um, you see, this is your dream. You fight for your dream. No, the Lord said that he's the Alpha and Omega. He's the Alpha. He's with you when he started this dream, when you were still in first year, when uh, you finished your law. And he will not leave you. No, he's also the Omega. He will uh, help you finish that dream. Don't, so don't, uh, um, don't deal on your disappointments, discouragements, no, the challenges of the past. Forget about those things. The Lord said that he is, a new, he is doing a new thing in your life. No? Do you not perceive it? This is now the chance no, of go. At ito na eh, tatawid na kayo. No? All you have to do is to, to cross that and a few months later, you will become a lawyer. So make sure that you are in good health and secondly, that you have a proper mental set. And of course, uh, stay close to God because uh, you will stay closer your, to your dream. It's just ilang days na lang, no? Just pray continually, keep the faith, no? Uh, sabi sa, sa Bible, no? Faith is the substance of the things that we hope for. The evidence of things that get seen. How would you know that you will become a lawyer? We'll see it already through the eyes of faith. No? And then after that, so taking, that will be the manifestation already of your faith. No? And we are one with you. In pulse, all the deans, we are one with you. We are praying that all of you will pass the bar examination. And I know that you're all uh, prepared. Ang kinakailangan lang, no, good health tayo. And of course, don't leave any blanks sa inyong uh, pagsagot. And I'm sure you will do well. Keep the faith and God bless everyone, uh, my future panyeros and compañeras. Thank you very much, Dean Jim, for sharing with us your extensive knowledge on criminal law. And thank you for your words of encouragement and wisdom to our bar takers. We would like to present you with a certificate of appreciation. So if I may read it, book. 
the Philippine Association of Law Schools, in collaboration with Rex Bookstore and Edu Campion, awards a certificate of appreciation to Dean Gemili to El Fistin for sharing his expertise as a research speaker on Bar of Philippines 2020-2021, the best bar ever webinar lecture series, given this 25th day of January in the year of our Lord 2022, signed by Mr. Don Timothy Buhain, CEO of Rex Bookstore. Again, thank you, thank you very thank much, you, Dean, thank and thank you. you to our partners, Rex Bookstore and Edo Hampion, for making this event possible. We would like to mention that our event partner, Rex Bookstore, recently released a free digital copy of Bar Prep Ready Set Pass, a light read on useful tips for the bar exam. This material was prepared by lawyers for would be lawyers, a product of collective wisdom, and born out of shared genuine concern for the profession and the men and women who make it great. You may get your own copy through the link found on the past Facebook post. We would like to remind everybody that our frequently asked topics on the eight bar subjects lecture series will resume tomorrow, Wednesday, January 26. So make sure to follow the past Facebook page for the roster of speakers and for, and for further updates. We hope that everybody tuned in to our stream, learned a lot from today's lecture from Dean Jim. Um, thank you, everybody. Have a great evening, and we will see you all tomorrow.